We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. My name is Rob H. And this week I'm here with... Oh, Lee Overstreet. I am pinch hitting in the 23. It's uh-huh. the year of the Lee 23. You know what I did? I still left Tom's name down there in the uh, lower third. But uh, oh, there we go. Okay, now we've got the right, right. person identified. If you're seeing it on YouTube, <laughs> it's Lee Overstreet. Not Tom Andrew this week. Tom no. uh, took a little day trip uh, with his family. Uh, all kinds of scheduling snafus went on. So we ended up recording this a day later and at an hour later than we typically do. So this week's episode is coming out a day late. Not going to matter if you're way in the future listening to it but hopefully for the first episode actually coming out after the passage of the new year you'll survive with it being a day late from our normally scheduled release i I would have recorded with rob a bit earlier but my wife kept doing the things she has to do so often that's reminding me of things i was obligated to do already Mm, mm, mm. (laughs) so here i am though as soon as i could get to you rob (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's. I guess that's one way of blaming it on your wife, even though you're the one who made the obligations oh, no. ahead of time. <laughs> no, no, that's why I say she has to do this all the time, unfortunately. <laughs> the poor woman. We created a calendar where this shouldn't happen, and I'm supposed mm-hmm. to look at it. So, you know, <laughs> well, Men, it's very nice what are you that do? we get to uh, welcome Lee back to the podcast first thing here in yeah. 2023. So uh, so that's all good. We get to catch up a little bit. Why don't we start off? Uh, what have you been watching recently that uh, you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, my big thing recently is for all mankind on Apple TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, we found out Ooh, that Apple TV plus got to make sure oh, you I'm put sorry. that in there. Oh, so everyone geez. knows it's on the streaming service and not just in like incorporated into the hardware. Cause you know, those names aren't confusing or anything. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I didn't even realize that. All I know is we have an LG TV <laughs> uh-huh. and the LG TV comes with, you get three free months That's right. <laughs> of Apple TV plus. <laughs> and so all I know is that this show sounded good. Mm-hmm. I had watched a couple of episodes that I got via something that rhymes with Schmitschmorant. I won't go into depth on that, how I got that. But <laughs> I decided it would be better to watch it in 4K HDR. Sure. Yes. And there was that deal. And it just ticks all the boxes for mm-hmm. me. So it's historical sci-fi. It's a what if the mm-hmm. Soviets got to the moon first and what would happen after that. And I'm digging it, man. I'm nice. digging it. It's it's really well shot. The mm-hmm. audio and video is fantastic. Are there some really two good seasons of that or more or fewer? Uh, there are three. Oh, okay. And I am most of the way through the second. Okay. So no spoilers, people, please. I know it's right. been a while and I'm, I'm way behind, but it, so that's my thing lately. I, and you know, I, uh, the last time I was on with you or two times ago, I asked mm-hmm. for uh, recommendations. And uh, so I've been, I've been trying to get my TV and movie watching mojo back. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of working. My attention span is very small nowadays. So. <laughs> well, if you still have some time left on your free trial after you're done for all mankind, Apple TV Plus does have some good other shows. So uh, I think you'd enjoy okay. Severance. Severance, there's only one season. It's not super long. So I think you'd be able to get through that before your free okay. trial is up. And uh, I really love Mythic Quest. That's that's a comedy. Uh, so uh-huh. I don't know if it'd be up your alley. It's like based inside of a video game company, a fic- fictitious and highly elevated video game company but they every yeah. season they do one or two episodes that are like outside of the regular cast and they okay. are like the highlights of the seasons they're they're absolutely fantastic the like non regular episodes <laughs> so so it would it have any of the same feel of silicon valley that was on hbo mm, yeah yeah i mean ah, mm. okay I mean, yes, and it's still its own thing. And okay, still, yeah, yeah. I don't mean you know, exactly it's Rob, like it. It's but... Rob McElhaney uh, from It's Always right. Sunny in Philadelphia, if you remember him. And okay. it's very much his style of humor. He's he's very much like in charge of the show, I believe, behind the scenes. So That's probably yeah. my kind of thing. Well, yeah, right. yeah, people are still free to send me. I'm still looking for cool sci-fi and right. comedy, nerdy comedy stuff, of course. That you'll means, you'll uh, run out before the, the free trial is done, and then you'll have to pay $5 a month. That's how they're going to get I you. I mean, we might just keep... Keep it. We have all kinds of crazy streaming <laughs> or things now. If you have any other devices, like basically anything that Apple TV Plus, the app got added to in like the past year, mm. all give you a three month free trial. <laughs> 
Oh, really? So, well, so all we have are check, old Rokus. So. Okay. But I mean, like, literally just check all your devices and see if something else will give you another three months because it's certainly not out of the question. The uh, only new hardware we've gotten recently is we, uh, for Christmas, Heather got me one of those uh, Roku remotes that integrates a volume and a mute and a power oh, yeah, button for yeah. your television. And hey, better. Yeah. I don't better think that better. would have Apple TV Plus on it, but you never no. know. Check your Roku. It's worth a try. Uh, yeah. So yeah, as far as what I was watching, uh, I watched uh, Disney's Strange World, which I think was their mm. most recent uh, full-length animated feature from Disney proper, not from Pixar. Um, mm. And so, yeah, uh, it, it had no musical numbers, which... I th- I always feel like a Disney movie deserves to have some musical numbers in it, um, you know, when it's from Disney proper, right? I don't expect it from yeah. Pixar, but I kind of expect it from Disney, to be honest. Um, so yeah. it didn't, didn't have any, uh, that felt a little bit lacking for me that didn't. I'm not a huge fan of their current um, character styling with the gigantic bulbous noses and the like lower <laughs> lips that stick way out and are like really exaggerated lip sync movements and stuff like I'm uh, like it looks like DreamWorks I gotta be honest it looks like DreamWorks huh. characters and I'm not well I'm now not I'm super... curious <laughs> well it's, all, it's sitting there on Disney plus so there's no reason you can't sneak yeah. a peek at it but yeah I I wasn't a huge fan of, of the character design the story, I mean, it's fine. It's Disney. It's never going to be bad. I'm certainly not like angry I watched it or anything like that. But um, yeah, it's not my favorite. Not my favorite Disney movie. Not the worst thing ever. And, and I mean, obviously, some of the visuals are absolutely stunning and beautiful because they always do a good job. They are very imaginative with the creatures of this strange world. Um, so yeah, that I can give it a thumbs up just for pure visual splendor. Uh, but well, didn't... that's half the fun, right? Yeah. With a good AV system. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But I, I didn't, I didn't over the moon love it. Uh, and then. I decided to complete uh, Marvel's Cinematic Universe Phase 4 because, oh my goodness, is that overstuffed for a phase. Just too many series, too many movies. And I mean, I had I had watched all the movies as they came, but I had like started Moon Knight. I had started Ms. Marvel. I had started She-Hulk. I hadn't finished those. So I went ahead and finished those in order. And I'm just like... That's the thing. That's why I can't get into any of it. It's the exhausting nature of it all. It's it's too much. It felt a bit like homework and nothing had a resolution. Everything is Uh, just, we're just, we're, it's just leading on to the next. Nothing has an ending. It it was very unsatisfying. She-Hulk was my favorite out of the more recent series that they did. um, Because it was doing its own thing, definitely had its own style. And I love Tatiana Maslany. I'll watch her in anything. So her charisma alone was enough to drive it. And then it was more humorous and her breaking the fourth wall was used really, really well and effectively. And, you know, they had cameos from other characters. So it was a, it was a fun show. That was my favorite of the bunch and at least its season actually wrapped up with a conclusion um which she she broke the fourth wall to be like hey this should like all wrap up in a way that makes sense for my character <laughs> like actually <laughs> okay took the, yeah i mean hilariously took the writers of the mcu to task about the thing i'm complaining about so at least they seem to be self-aware somebody over there is self-aware <laughs> What's okay. Okay. So that, that was good. Gives me hope that maybe phase five, starting with Ant Man, uh, what is it, Quantumania, that's uh, coming up there in, I think, February. I don't know. I think that's the next one. So that's. But what to- happens to people like, say, young people, young adults who. Uh, aren't watching these things as children anymore. Uh-huh. Where do you start? You, you, we're at a point now where there's so many. It was yeah. kind of like when I decided I wanted to start watching Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Where mm-hmm. do you start? You can't start with the yeah. first thing from the 60s. No. And so all I did was just <laughs> I, In start. fact, you truly can't because there's a bunch of episodes just missing because right. they yeah, literally yeah, yeah. taped over them. <laughs> so oh, they're just God. not, they're just, they just don't exist anymore. But I mean, you can start yeah. in the modern era, right? So that that, that would yeah, be... and I just started on the one that was happening the week yeah. I decided, right? No. So, and that apparently wasn't a very good episode. My uh, feeling yeah, is the same that... problem with Marvel. What are people yeah. to do as time goes on when there's going to be a hundred Marvel movies? I'm My not feeling watching is them. that the MCU has has gone the comic book route too faithfully. You know, okay. with, with comic yeah. books, it, it's overwhelming and impenetrable. And, right, and right. It's, it's getting that way with all of these it's shows. Kind of inevitable so. when you are doing comic book movies, like, I guess. When Moon Knight inevitably shows up in something, because that can just be the CGI character and they can just go, get Oscar Isaac to come into a vocal booth and do the voice and not even have him on set. Like, when he inevitably shows up in some other movie or show, like... 
it's, it's any like somebody's going to be cheering and like a few people have watched it on Disney Plus, but everyone else is going to be like, OK, dude, in all white with a cape on. He's, yeah. he's a hero, I guess. That's what <laughs> that's that how is. I watch like, any of that stuff. <laughs> it's just I don't know. Anyway, uh, so I guess I wasn't a gigantic. I mean, I didn't hate anything I watched this week, but I guess I wasn't a gigantic fan. So it's it's kind of watch it if you please. Who has the time? That's that's my question. But it was all right. Disney Plus for me this week. Anyway, speaking of who has the time, we've got plenty to get to on this podcast. So this is AV Rant. It's the show that answers your home theater and AV questions. And to get those questions asked, all you have to do is send them to us via email at our email address question at avrant.com. That is by far the best way to reach us with questions. They will be answered on the podcast first in, first out, the order that they're received. So question at avrant.com. You can also find us at our website, of course, avrant.com. Hint, hint in the email address there. And uh, on Facebook, uh-huh. we're still around there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. And on YouTube, youtube.com slash avrant. If you've never seen Lee Overstreet before, you can you can get a look at his face. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. Come <laughs> look at me. That's the real reward. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know what? Everybody's bespectacled now. Tom's got glasses. You've got glasses. Yeah. I've always had glasses. All of us are sitting here with glasses these days. That's okay. Well, right. next time I'm putting my contacts in. That's no, right. if I put my contacts in, then I need the reading glasses for up close. Ah, uh, yes, yes, It's yes. hopeless, isn't it? I guess I could just get really close. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. There you go. That's worth Without the YouTube subscription anything. right there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So getting in touch with us individually. Uh, I'm Rob at AVRant.com if you want to email just me. Tom is Tom at AVRant.com if you want to email just him. I guess we're technically all still on Twitter. I mean, Lee's still active over there. I'm still putting yeah. the podcast up when it goes out over there. Yeah, so yeah. I will say I am at First Reflect. Tom is at AVRant underscore Tom, although definitely don't try to ping him there because he hasn't even been putting the podcast up on Twitter. As of Not late. really a He's point to it. He's yeah. disappeared there. And uh, yeah, Lee, Lee's still on Twitter too. So where can they find Lee Overstreet? Uh, you can find Lee Overstreet at Lee Overtweet uh-huh. on Twitter. There he and is. And then of course, I always always mention my second account, Tesla Lusa. That's right. Yeah. He lives in Tuscaloosa, folks. He loves his puns, yeah. in case you couldn't tell. Yeah, I do. I, I have to be creative with the names. So. <laughs> and I, you know, one day I'll have an email one day. Oh, yeah. We got to get to that because uh, that leads us uh-huh. right into our listeners uh-huh. of the week. That is, in fact, mentioned. So uh, listeners of the week or folks who support our lovely podcast in some way, financial support is always very much appreciated. You can do that by going to our website, the desktop version. You can switch to that on your mobile device if you need to. The desktop version mm-hmm. over on the right-hand side has the picture of a cup of coffee. If you click on that, it'll take you over to PayPal where you can make a one-time donation if you please. You don't have to have a PayPal account. You can just use a credit card for a one-time donation if you'd like to. I don't know if anybody donated via PayPal this week because Tom is the only person who sees that and he's away. So if we missed any Mm. names, we will get to you next week. But thank you so much if you did. And then Patreon is the other way you can show financial support. That is an automatic monthly donation. You sign up at Patreon. You say the amount you want to donate automatically every month. The minimum is a dollar. And we have 139 patrons who've signed up to do that at patreon.com slash podcast. So yeah. Getting close That's to a bigger number than last time. That's yeah. what happened. It went up. Yeah. Usually when the month changes over, it goes down because some people forgot that their credit cards expired. This time actually went <laughs> up. So yeah, happy to see that. We will soon have one gross of patrons. That's the next That's 144. Right. <laughs> That's the next milestone. And uh, I forgot to put in here. I'm pretty sure it was... Grinder, who sent some photos with permission to use them on avgadgets.com, where Tom is the mm-hmm. editor in chief. Mm-hmm. I'll have to look up to make sure it was him, but I'm pretty darn sure my mind is telling me that it was Grinder who was the one who gave permission to use his photos on AV Gadgets this week. So thank you Probable. for doing that. Tom will thank you. Uh, and then, yeah, we have people who sent us just notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going through the yeah. times. We're fingers crossed that 2023 is actually going to be a, a an up year from the past, but uh, you know. We'll see how it goes. We're four days in. Things are all pretty right weird so here already. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's been some goings on on my end too. So here we oh, go. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, fingers crossed. So those notes this week came from Dylan, Brad, Eric, who said Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Eric. Happy New Year. Stephen, who took our advice and will be incorporating subwoofers into his two channel music system. He says hey. he's been a listener since the Dina days. So it's only taken that wow. long 
to convince him that we like subwoofers no matter what the system is being used for. I started listening in the Dina days and <laughs> it right. took until 2020. It took, it takes a while for me we to wear get a you subwoofer. down. That's the secret. We wore Stephen down. Uh, also That's got it. a note of gratitude from James. He said North America's winter storm conditions even made the news where he is in the UK. So wow. he's hoping we didn't have too rough of a time. Uh, it yeah, was kind of rough. We've shared. got some dead plants. <laughs> yeah. I'll say that. Shared some stories. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's been it's been a thing. It hasn't been completely trivial. Uh, also carrying on notes from Mike Nathan, who enjoyed our 3D Wow episode last week. He says, please give Lee and Avi Randy email address in 2023. Yes! I'm sorry, Nathan, you're talking to the wrong co-host. Tom's the yes! one who'd be in charge of that, but you know he'll never see these because these notes get erased after this week. So there it is. I Lee. mean, we I'm are sorry. beginning. Nathan tried my tenth year That's right. helping out on the podcast. My I mean, tenth year, and all I can do is keep saying my stupid Twitter handle. There's nothing I love more than a running gag. So at this point, uh, carrying on, still more notes of gratitude coming in from Greg, who says we mentioned how every TV brand has their own name for HDMI CEC. We didn't mention mm. LGs, which is Simplink. Yes, Simp Link. What a name, he says. Yeah, that's they good. were going to change it to HDMI CUC, but that was a little too <laughs> Take, controversial. Taking taken on a little different connotation, that simply these bit. days. But uh, there you go. Uh, Gurinder, he uh, sent us a note of gratitude. He also says, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Gurinder. His Happy basement theater is still under construction, but they had company over for New Year's, so he did a very makeshift setup so they could still watch something. Uh, good thing he had some two-by-fours and a very deep acoustic panel laying around because uh, yeah. that very deep acoustic panel served as the stand for his projector at the back of the room, which I got to say, wow. you have more faith in that than I would have, but good on you. And then some two by fours with the surround on wall surround speakers attached them to literally leaning at an angle against the side walls. <laughs> I got to tell you, I wouldn't have cared about surround speakers if I was doing this makeshift setup. I just would have had front left and right and done things no, in I get stereo, it. but he's No, no he's I get it. And I respect more, it. More dedicated than I am. I respect that too. That's, you know, honestly, that's better than many of our setups, even just like that. So congratulations on having succeeded with that makeshift setup. Still more notes of gratitude coming in for the New Year. Kevin says he's a listener for life. Keep doing what we do. That's our intention, Kevin. One way or another, even if it's a little late. We'll keep on doing it. Uh, Stefan is another person who wrote in. Jack, yet another, says our old secret two-hour plus club word. I won't say it here because it's a secret. You have to listen for the full two hours plus. Uh, He made a suggestion for what our next one should be, but he never said our current secret words. So, Jack, I don't know if I can believe you. Are you really a member of the two-hour plus club? You know, Mm. you you didn't hear the two secret words we're using right now. Now he's going to, like, frantically go back through many, many episodes because I'm pretty sure we only said them once at the very end of an episode and i can't remember which one it was uh every moment our... <laughs> is important That's every right. moment the two hour plus club is so much better than the mile high club <laughs> right last on our list of notes of gratitude for this week carl who says he hopes everyone had a wonderful holiday break so yeah. thank you so much to everybody who sent in those notes of gratitude they're much appreciated Thanks to all our listeners of the week. Thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. And now I'm going to give my voice a rest while Lee starts in on the news. Yeah, the of course, the big news is uh, everything out of CES 2023. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what we're able to cover today came from pre-announcements and off-site coverage. So as you're listening to this episode, you might be seeing news uh, from the show floor that we haven't seen yet as of mm-hmm. this recording, because that's how time works. It is. Uh, if, if there's anything interesting, we'll talk about it next week and i'm sure there will be but let's start with disney plus the aforementioned disney plus has confirmed they'll be adding imax signature sound by dts as an option on their imax enhanced titles but so far they've only confirmed that it will be available from the built-in apps of imax enhanced tvs from sony and hisense they've also said it will work with imax enhanced av receivers but that might only be via EARC from an IMAX enhanced TV. No separate streaming devices have been confirmed yet. No specific date was given. You'll still be able to select Dolby Atmos instead if you prefer. Now, I have not sat down to read the specs of IMAX signature sound by DTS. I'm assuming it's a- an Atmos competitor. Well, they didn't give specifics which everybody wanted. It's not even certain that this is DTS X. Uh, much mm-hmm. like Dolby, how Dolby Atmos can be an extension on top of either long lossy Dolby Digital Plus 
or lossless Dolby True HD. There's both a lossy mm. and a lossless version of Dolby Atmos. Uh, a similar thing applies over in DTS land where they have DTS HD high resolution, which is lossy, and you can have mm -hmm. a DTS X extension on that, or they have DTS HD master audio, which is lossless, and you can have a DTS X extension on top of that. Uh, they didn't say what codec is being used or if DTS X is part of this at all. It might just be 5.1 uh, for all we know. So they didn't get into this. It could just be it. two extra height speakers because IMAX is yeah. taller. Don't you want <laughs> your sound to be in four by three? <laughs> you know, I mean, w when it came to IMAX enhanced Blu-ray discs. It was not necessary to use IMAX enhanced equipment. You would still get the full lossless DTS audio with any AV receiver that could decode mm -hmm. it, including DTSX. It didn't have to be IMAX enhanced. You would still get the HDR10 plus uh, HDR video if you had a TV that could decode that format, or HDR10 if you didn't have HDR10 plus. It didn't need to be IMAX enhanced. So. All of this is a little bit iffy, it's a little bit uncertain, Very. but mm -hmm. the whole idea is this is the first confer confirmation that some streaming service will be sending some kind of DTS audio instead of Dolby Audio only. Uh, so mm. we, we know at least that much. Sort of a new tech trend nowadays where you announce a product and then you begin to make it. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> it's just the way things are nowadays. So what's new with OLEDs, you yeah. ask? Panasonic was the first brand to confirm their flagship MZ2000 or MZ2000, if you're from a nation that has pretty money, mm -hmm. uh, OLEDs, uh, will be using LG Display's micro lens array technology to boost both full screen and peak light output, as well as improving off axis viewing, which is amazing to me because I always think of OLEDs as having amazing off axis That's right. viewing. Yeah, I was the expecting venerable... that anything talking about adding some sort of lensing to the light yeah. would result in narrower viewing angles. Right. But yeah, yeah. according to an expert that I trust that you're just about to mention, he said, nope, yeah. it's actually opposite. Yeah, that expert is the venerable Vincent Teo from HDTV Test. He was able to measure a pre-release sample and confirm that it really could produce 1,500 nit highlights while also clearing any image retention even faster than last year's models despite being 50% brighter. That's encouraging. Yeah. So yeah. uh, hopefully that's all working correctly. Mm -hmm. And speaking of OLED TVs using micro lens array, LG Electronics announced their full 2023 OLED TV lineup, which will include the 60 hertz only A3 series, the B3 series with an Alpha 7 Gen 6 processor and two HDMI 2.1 ports, the C3 series with an Alpha 9 Gen 6 processor, four HDMI 2.1 ports, and OLED Evo panels, and an upgraded G3 series with, you guessed it, micro lens array technology mm -hmm. for a significant boost in light output. So, you know, for a while there, I felt like announced improvements were just extremely incremental. This feels like maybe we'll really notice. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, uh, you know, LG, uh, for their G3 series, they mentioned a 70% increase in light output compared to what they call conventional OLED, which is going mm -hmm. back kind of a few generations in panel technology now. Panasonic with the confirmed via measurement from an expert that I trust, 50% increase over just last year's, um, uh, you know, flagship OLED that they had over there at Panasonic. Should be noted, Panasonic is not selling their TVs in North America. Uh, they, are, they are in Europe and Asia only. Uh, but it was still Why? newsworthy. <laughs> yeah, still newsworthy. That's a because brand I've always really liked. I know, I know. I mean, going back to their plasmas, right? But um, right. yeah, ho hopefully, maybe one day they'll come back. In many ways, they if you want the absolute pinnacle of accuracy and color, they're the ones that deliver it. But uh, yeah, they, they were the first to confirm they were using that micro lens array. And then uh, after after they did so, uh, it, it uh, a little birdie told everyone that LG is like, yeah, yeah, that, that that's how we're doing it too. Not a surprise, well, yeah, yeah. but uh, took a little <laughs> bit of prodding to get the confirmation. So yeah, that's, that's the big advancement in uh, LG Display's W OLED technology. Mm -hmm. Right, that is very cool. Uh, also, uh, speaking of LG, uh, all 2023 LG OLEDs get a new version of WebOS that looks a bit less cluttered and returns the easy row of apps along the bottom edge of the screen that WebOS was originally known for, which I kind of dig that mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the G3 series continues with its zero gap design that fits completely flush against a wall, which is mm -hmm. very cool. But if the G3's design still doesn't hug the wall as closely as you would like, 
perhaps you'll be interested in LG's newest OLED model, the 97-inch only M3. They're touting it as the world's first wireless OLED TV with transmission up to 4K 120 from its Zero Connect box. However, the TV panel itself still has power cords, so there's still one wire. <laughs> But yeah, there would kind of have to be. I guess you could poke it into your wall and run it down, et cetera. Sure. Yeah, they're they're not using batteries like that uh, <laughs> brand that we talked about uh, last week who are at CES showing their 55-inch truly wireless OLED that runs off of batteries that you can swap out. Uh, but this it is, just, uh, mm. I guess, the next best thing. This is down to one wire, just the power cord. So uh, yeah. It's not bad. M3 series only available in the 97 inch size so it's a it's a behemoth I don't expect it to be affordable uh but oh, no there it no, is I, I'm not even gonna ask if That's I'm right. afraid they'll charge me something just to ask yeah if you need to ask it's not for you <laughs> no it's not uh turning our attention to Samsung mm -hmm. uh 2023 brings their second generation of quantum dot OLED TVs as previously mentioned on this podcast they'll be offering a new 77 inch size in addition to the 55 and 65 inch sizes that were available last year they are also going to have two series uh s95c will be a super slim design with a separate one connect box for the inputs it will also get upgraded speakers s90c will basically have the same design as last year's s95b models mm -hmm. the new qd oled panels are brighter than last year in their native color temperature they can hit peaks of 2000 nits so that ought to give you a suntan that <laughs> comes down to about 1350 with an accurate D 65 white point. So it will be interesting when they're pitted head to head with LG's G three micro lens array models. So things are really going to start blasting you in the face soon. That's kind of exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they also get some good sunglasses. They also need a new screen coating that prevents their perfect black levels from slightly washing out in the presence of ambient light. So they're, everything is getting a little bit better. Yeah, that seems and to be the story this year. I mean, honestly... You know, because it's sort of like these incremental improvements every year, I don't think full appreciation and credit goes into just how much work this stuff really is. This takes years to right. develop and deploy. So uh, I, I appreciate that, you know, nobody's resting on their laurels here. That's that's clearly the case. Um, you know, continuing to advance OLED technology, be it LG's WOLED or Samsung's, uh, you know, Quantum Dot OLED, they're both pushing forward at a, at a strong pace. The prices keep coming down. The screen sizes keep getting. Uh, larger and expanding so I, i'm really happy with uh, everything that's going on in oled land yeah i've seen some dirt cheap original uh lg oled 55 inch mm -hmm. i think they were what like 800 dollars or something yeah. like it, it got really cheap uh tcl also confirmed they will be bringing qd oled tvs to market in the second half of 2023 the other qd oled tv brand sony isn't showing any new tv models at ces this year opting instead for their own event in the spring so they're just too good for ces <laughs> our educated guess though is that they decided to wait for mediatek's newest hdmi chips that provide much better support for 4k 120 with vrr and dolby vision panasonic's mz2000 announcement included confirmation that they're still using last year's mediatek chip and their game mode cannot support Dolby Vision at 120 hertz as a result. Yeah, so that is a bit of speculation. That is an educated guess as to why mm -hmm. Sony's models are not ready to go at CES. Uh, we're all crossing our fingers and hoping that's the case because the solution that they had of four different HDMI modes for their two mm -hmm. HDMI 2.1 ports on their televisions in 2022 where you could choose... 4K 120 uh, with VRR support, but no Dolby Vision whatsoever, or Dolby Vision support, but no 120 hertz support whatsoever, uh, or just the regular standard mode in case you're still connecting a 3D Blu-ray player that wigs out in any other mode. And then there was one other enhanced mode that was like, I think it was enhanced 4K 120, but without VRR for some reason. I don't know. Like it was, it was ridiculous to have to go through these settings in the input menu uh, mm. to decide which batch of features you'd like to have. But we would like to have them all, please. We would like all the green check marks when we plug in an Xbox Series X. So 
the brand it's new... It's a lot to think about. <laughs> it isn't it, though? It's a little too much. So the brand new MediaTek chi- uh, Media chips are supposed to just support it all. Uh, we know that they exist. They were announced and everything like that. Uh, but obviously, it takes time to implement. So fingers crossed, that's what Sony is waiting for. And then uh, we won't have to worry so much about plugging your you know high-end consoles into Sony TVs in 2023. That'd be nice. There you go. Well, one more thing about Samsung, and then we'll wrap up the uh, news yep. headlines. Uh, Samsung once again showed their modular micro LED displays this year with the smallest screen sizes yet, all the way down to 50 inch and 63 inch models, and all the way up to 140 inches. Uh, they remain modular displays, so resolution decreases along with screen size. They've branded the 76 inch and 110 inch sizes as micro LED CX. And while they're expected to still be expensive, they'll no longer require custom installation, apparently. So you can snap those things together like Legos. Something like that. I, I, As far as I know, the consumer ones, they are like selling it to you as a pre-assembled panel. Um, mm-hmm. that, that's what I've heard about them. So you aren't actually getting individual modules that you're snapping together yourself at home. That is the custom installation version for the much larger sizes. Um, but for but the, you hit a point where if it gets too big, you can't really ship that. And well, yeah. It, yeah, it is going to have to be a That's why they're so, focusing on 76, 110, which is really pushing it, but that'll just fit through a standard doorway as long as you don't have to go around any corners. Um, so yeah, that's 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 where they're going with these uh, micro LEDs. They're still calling it a luxury consumer product. So that means no high kidding. prices. Uh, but yeah. uh, once again, you know, every single year it continues to advance. Uh, so, you know, looking forward to the day when, yeah, you can just buy yourself a pile of essentially tablet sized displays with no frames whatsoever and make whatever screen size and aspect ratio you want. That's going to be fun. So we've got a lot of comments before we, we even get to, to questions. So let's just rip right through these. Uh, Joe of Joe and tell fame on YouTube wrote in to say, thanks for our discussion of the spatial audio calibration toolkit disc and digital download that he is selling in partnership with Chana. Am I saying that right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm better known as techno dad on youtube he felt our take on it was fair which he appreciated but they are hoping it will attract more than just the rew crowd as we put it what did we how did we put it because i wasn't here for putting it that way yeah i was saying that <laughs> I, I think it's targeted mostly at the room eq wizard measurement That's crowd it, okay. uh since room eq wizard itself doesn't have an easy way of outputting individual test signals to your overhead mm. speakers it can do the 7.1 bed layer but if you want a signal to come out of just your front wide or just one of your six potential overhead speakers it doesn't have an easy way to do that directly mm. in room eq wizard this gives you test signals that you can use either via the download or from the disc that you could use in conjunction with Room EQ Wizard. So I was thinking, oh, that's probably the crowd that's mostly going to go for it. But he's saying he's open. It's not going to be just that crowd. I'm not going to hate on anything that ups the OCD level. You know how I am. Uh, (laughs) They put in a lot of effort to make sure anybody could use it, even without any measurement equipment. And they're in the planning stages for training videos to help the non-measurement crowd feel comfortable getting into the audio calibration side of things. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. Give your way to ease into it. One fun thing to try if you have AirPods, give the Atmos audio tests a go. The way object audio movement is translated into Apple spatial audio for headphones is a very interesting experience in his opinion. Worth a listen. Uh, He also clarified that the project began with the idea that it would be a physical disc but shipping worldwide isn't always easy and affordable, no kidding. So the downloadable version came about to address that, and that opened up the opportunity of being able to offer updates to the downloadable version. So they wanted to make sure anybody who buys the disc will get those. That's why you get the downloaded version too if you pre-order the disc, no extra charge. So yes, everything is downloadable now. Yeah. Uh, and, And since we're talking about Atmos test tones to help you calibrate and measure your system, if you have an Apple TV, Studio 6 Digital offers a surround generator in the Apple TV App Store for $25 with an optional 9.1.6 Atmos generator as an in-app add-on for another $60. The surround generator is intended to work with Studio 6 Digital's $20 audio tools app for iOS and iPad OS devices, particularly the impulse response in app add on, which is another $60. That was a mouthful. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know, not inexpensive. You get all that. It actually costs more than the spatial audio disc uh, from, uh, yeah. from Joe Intel and Technodad. Uh, but um 
you know, this uh, would also be like a full measurement suite that you're getting there along with that uh, signal generator. So I just found it interesting that we have some ways now of generating up to 9.1.6 individual test signals to come out of one speaker at a time. In fact, it's kind of fun to do the 9.1.6 test on a 5.1.2 setup and just see how that gets mapped, right? To see where it places it, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, you got a 9.1.6 signal, but, you know, if you're playing your top rear left, well, where does that sound actually come out of? It's kind of fun Hmm. to be able to do that with the surround signal generator. So it is, uh, you know, you're looking at, what, uh, $75 there, um, or is it more than that? $85, $85, right. whatever 80, it is. 80. I forgot what the numbers yeah. were in the math. But, you know, uh, to actually do that Dolby Atmos add-on to the surround signal generator, and that's assuming you already have an Apple TV 4K uh, on the hardware side of things. So, uh, you know, not not super inexpensive, but uh, I just like that there are options now for getting those uh, individual test signals to your, your full that Atmos setup. All right, we got some comments from Michael. Uh, also came across the annoying problem of trying to close the YouTube app on his Apple TV. <laughs> yeah. He offers the easiest solution yet. Just press and hold the back button rather than pressing the home button at all. When you press and hold the back button, the YouTube exit message doesn't pop up and it just takes you back to the Apple TV's home menu. So that's a lot more like a Roku, right? Yeah, yeah. So Excellent. good tip. I hadn't thought Very of mentioning that. It's that's training you instead of doing something in the settings for the device. Uh, but yeah, that that is certainly the easier it's one solution. Of those <laughs> little irritating things that Isn't if you it find though? a solution is wonderful. Like on, on our LG OLED, the app for YouTube TV, sort of the cable TV mm-hmm, service, mm-hmm. sometimes it just won't. And the only way you can yeah. get it to load is to go to the YouTube app. Okay. Select YouTube TV inside that app, and then it loads YouTube TV. Wonderful. One of those weird Perfect. things, and I don't know any way around it, but that's just so intuitive LG. for your mother to use. Yeah. Uh, well, mom's <laughs> doing better because she has the Roku. Okay. And she loves her little Roku, and by yep. God, she has figured that thing out, and she watches all kinds of weird <laughs> stuff. And she's actually having a good time with fiber and Roku. So, uh, continuing with some comments, Nathan. This is probably pretty niche, but it might help somebody out there. Nathan has an APC S20 battery backup unit, actually the Crestron branded version of it. It started beeping at him, as so many things in my house do do now, Uh, with air lights blinking that he looked up and indicated an inverter fault that requires servicing. But he found some info online saying that particular error sometimes pops up when it's just a dead battery. Oh yeah. No servicing actually required, just a battery replacement. To their credit, APC customer service actually confirmed this to be true. <laughs> and an additional shout out to B&H Photo, who quickly shipped him a replacement battery when he ordered from them, and also kindly confirmed that he'd be able to return it if it turned out it's really an inverter problem and not just a dead battery. Great customer service all around. I do like B&H Photo. I just bought oh, yeah. a monitor from it. Yeah, they're good uh, to shop happy. from Canada, too. They do full yeah. landed price, no additional duties or anything at your door when it's delivered. So uh, oh. I appreciate uh, how doing business with them across the border. They make it easy. Yeah, man. Yeah, I've had a good, good results from them. He's happy to report replacing the battery did the trick. Hey, that's all it was. <laughs> he got the APC unit in 2016 and has never replaced the battery till now, so that's pretty good. Yeah. They do say right in the manual to expect a three to five year battery lifespan, so it lasted longer than that. And he's happy it didn't actually require shipping it anywhere for a repair. Man, that's a good feeling when yeah. you when you get a thing and it solves the thing the relatively easy solution (laughs) yes much i've replaced batteries on uh, apc battery backup units and it's it's pretty straightforward and wow so much cheaper let's move on to jack jack's kids had a party and something that looks like cheese whiz (laughs) something that looks like cheese whiz so i hope it's cheese whiz yeah got on his seymour av projection screen oh my yeah it looks like cheese whiz is my favorite line of the night. That's the name of the show. Looks <laughs> yeah, like I think cheese whiz. So, yeah. <laughs> he has their center stage UF fabric, and remembering our advice, he reached out to Seymour AV to ask them what's the best way to clean the stain. They had some pretty standard advice: remove as much solid material as possible, then blot using distilled water. But then they said something he never expected, and he thought he'd share since it came directly from Seymour AV themselves. They said that if it's a fixed frame screen where you can remove the screen fabric and not have any frame attached, i.e. this won't work for a roll down screen with an attached black border, you can throw the entire screen fabric in the wash. 
What? I know. You s- I never, s- ever would have thought that. What? <laughs> use cold water only, he says. Gentle cycle and hang it to dry. But it's actually okay to wash the whole darn screen. Do you iron it? No, not that kind of heat. They, okay, yeah. 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 Uh, like, it just, it's not that much like a shirt, apparently. <laughs> not quite. They, they said to expect it to be wrinkly after hang drying, but the screen tension will flatten it back out over time. So... If blotting with distilled water doesn't work well enough and you still have something that looks like cheese whiz, (laughs) give it a try. Throw it in the wash as you should anything else. I mean, I certainly wouldn't throw it in my little apartment-sized washing machine. Okay, Uh, But if you got a if you got a big you got a big washing machine, maybe I Oh yeah, maybe a front loader. I would feel incredibly uncomfortable doing can you imagine i know like i'm nervous thinking about it (laughs) but but it worked as straight straight from the manufacturer so gotta take their word for it and you know what if that fails guess whose son is buying a new screen fabric that's what i would be saying yeah buddy Uh uh-huh and no more eating or whatever you were doing near the screen Let's move on to questions. Oh, yeah. That's what this uh, podcast is yeah. about. Questions So and hopefully, before we get halfway through the show, we can start some <laughs> uh, new questions. Let's see. From last week, we have some questions left over. Uh, Kevin has a question. We recently compared Paradigm's Defiance X12 subwoofer to some slightly less expensive SVS models. We mentioned how one of SVS's sealed models, it was the SB3000, would have very similar output to the Paradigm sub, but was just a little smaller and a little less expensive. And then we also mentioned a couple of ported SVS subs, the PB2000 Pro and PC2000 Pro cylinder that could offer better output, quote unquote, better output, Mm -hmm. while still costing less. Reading between the lines a little bit, and yes, you should always do that with everything we say. (laughs) uh, Would it also be fair to interpret our answer as saying the PB2000 Pro has better output than the SB3000. Is that a fair read between the lines, Rob? (laughs) Oh, well, why don't we finish the question there? Well, sure. He would have expected the higher end series to be superior. 3000 should be better than 2000 because the number's bigger. So can we explain? (laughs) Mm, Yes. So yeah, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure I did use that word better and better is very often a problematic word to use because it is is imprecise in its meaning. Mm. Um, To be more precise... What we can say definitively is that the ported PB2000 Pro or the ported PC2000 Pro cylinder Mm -hmm. at 20 hertz and 25 hertz has more shear output capability than the sealed box SB3000 subwoofer. So even though the 3000 series has a more expensive driver, just the physical driver in it is a little beefier and more expensive and a little bit bigger magnet, and it has a more powerful amplifier inside of that 3000 series, despite those things, the uh, just mechanical advantages of a ported design allows Mm -hmm. the little bit less powerful, like, Lower wattage, slightly less powerful magnet um, in the 2000 series, uh, the 2000 Pro series, to actually output higher sound pressure level way down at 20 hertz and 25 hertz, where the port is contributing a lot to that output. Okay. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, when we say better, I mean, I would classify being able to hit reference level output at 20 hertz as better 20 hertz output (laughs) than not being able to hit full reference volume at 20 hertz, right? Now, I mean, better in the sense that you're getting the sound pressure level, right? Now, if we're talking about other facets of sound quality, if we were talking about transient response, uh, distortion levels, noise levels, those Mm -hmm. types of things, um, I mean, what I will say is that all the way down to the 1000 Pro series in SVS's lineup, I don't call those entry-level subs. I mean, they're not priced no. like entry-level subs anymore, and the performance is not entry-level either. SVS mm-hmm. cares a great deal about all facets. Is yeah. the distortion level, the noise level, the transient response of a PB-16 Ultra superior to that of a PB-1000 Pro in addition to having greater output across the board? Yes, I would say so. Right. But that said, 
the starting point at the 1000 Pro series is stellar levels of distortion, noise, and transient response yeah. and group yeah. delay, right? That that DSP control that they put into all of their models does a really excellent job of controlling all of those things that might lead to any sort of sound of overhang or distortion in the sound or anything like that. You just don't get that at a, a truly audible, noticeable level from any SVS sub. So putting a PB2000 Pro up against an SB3000, they're actually at the same price point. They're just significantly different form factors. And one of them ported and one of them sealed. Uh, it's not as cut and dry as saying, well, the 3000 series has the superior driver and amplifier, therefore it's better. It's, right. it's not that simple. Like what you can say is that the PB3000 in its gargantuan sized box, uh, right. you know, the ported version that uses that 3000 series driver and amplifier, right. it has even more output, including at 20 Hertz than the 2000 Pro. So right. that's more of a like for like. And you would have the, yeah, 3000 is better essentially in every way than 2000 Pro when it's sealed versus sealed or ported versus ported. Uh, but when you're comparing ported versus sealed and specifically what we we were focusing on is that really deep 20 hertz output well you're getting more 20 hertz output from the ported 2000 pro so hopefully that clarifies it kevin i hope so too yeah and and kevin you make me nervous analyzing every word now now i feel like i have to be so careful <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was his intent. It's just very understandable. You're like, why? Why is this no, series a higher it. number if if the lower series is better? But right, yeah. But if you were comparing yeah, the the ported versus ported, sealed versus sealed, that's where you could make a very sort of direct. Yeah, the three thousand is, is just better. Compare your apples to slightly different apples and not that's right. oranges. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, Greg, Tom's explanation on AV rant and write up on AV gadgets about infrasonic frequencies really got Greg thinking, but there's really no other information easily found on the internet about it. <laughs> yeah. Really? So he has thought of an, ex he has a thought experiment for us. It does seem to him that worrying about reproducing sounds below 20 Hertz is pretty much a waste of effort. He's also seen it stated many places that the lower the note you're trying to produce, the more power it takes. So if you're trying to make your subwoofers play down to single digits, are you actually robbing your system of headroom for the higher bass frequencies that we can hear and feel? If you were to introduce basically a brick wall 20 hertz high pass filter, would that improve the performance of your subwoofer? He's just asking for a friend quote yes unquote. of course yeah right you know it, it is a logical <laughs> thought that uh the the bigger the sound wave uh, literally the longer sound wave and the harder mm. to hear the more power it would take to do anything with it so that has some logic to it doesn't it yeah 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 it's an interesting thought experiment i think uh so the 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 issue in trying to just say uh, okay, let's say we're trying to play 15 hertz as well as 20 hertz. We're trying to have mm. our subwoofer play linearly all the way down to 15 hertz. Uh, you know, uh, Tom's whole write-up, which uh, I prompted him to go on. I, I had actually seen it talked about on some kind of nature program all to do with elephants and how yeah, elephants yeah. are essentially screaming at each other in infrasonic frequencies and people who have researched elephants for years had no idea they were making those <laughs> sounds. They weren't yeah. feeling some tingling in their chest, some rumbling, or even their eyes vibrating or any of the things that, you know, home theater fans like to say those infrasonic uh, right. things that, that we're not, we're, everybody agrees we're not <laughs> hearing it with our ears none of those biologists poop their pants when yeah, the elephant hit the brown note you know, that we're, 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 so supposedly <laughs> we feel it uh but uh, all the indications no. of people who were standing right next to elephants who were bellowing at 12 hertz, uh, you know, and could be heard by other elephants six miles away. Uh, those wow. researchers had no idea those sounds were being made until they captured it with a microphone and transposed it. And what do you know? Here are these amazingly loud sounds that are coming out of these elephants. So that's where some of our, uh, you know, we're taking some of that and going, did, do we really need to reproduce those at home? Uh, this, this supposed not. you're going to feel it thing. Uh, now, there is, of course, the. Uh, this isn't even getting to Greg's question, but just talking about this whole infrasonic thing in general. Uh, there is the phenomenon where if you take a uh, longer wavelength of, of whatever types of waves that you're dealing with and add that to higher wavelengths, it will change the wave pattern, right? This is what mm -hmm. happens when we see heat waves, right? We can't see infrared light 
just infrared light on its own, but we can see the wave interference pattern that infrared light can create invisible light. And it shows up to our eyes as heat waves. We've all seen heat, that. Heat ripples coming up off of something hot. That's in right. The so we're seeing yeah. the evidence that infrared light is there without seeing infrared light directly. Our eyes aren't able to detect the infrared light, but we're seeing the impact that it has on the visible light spectrum for humans. Anyway, mm. Um, mm. so does a similar thing happen with infrasonic? frequencies yes it does i mean that's how waves work there will be a change to the wave pattern with the presence of infra infrasonic frequencies the question is if they were there during the recording then those interference patterns will be there whether the fundamental infrasonic frequency is generated or not right mm. if you're capturing the interference pattern at the audible frequencies during the recording then that's already present you don't have to actually generate the infrasonic frequency it's already built into the wave pattern right, that right, you right. did capture sure. in the audible range on the other side of it is if it wasn't really meant to be there like nobody knew they were recording it but it's part of the recording and you actually start playing that i mean what do we consider heat waves, right? It's a form of distortion, right? It's distorting the right. visible light in a way <laughs> the that- The part you want to see, yeah. Did Was that the intention to distort the audible part of the <laughs> frequency range with this infrasonic fundamental that they didn't realize they were recording, right? So uh, whether- I don't know, I feel like that might be overthinking it even because sure. it, you, as long as you're recording what happened, the, That's in, right. the interference happened- that's what you no, want to I'm hear. No, but I'm talking about maybe like electronic, ge electronically generated oh, sound or something, yeah, right? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah okay. you, were, you weren't okay, recording yeah. a live event. You're you're mm, generating yeah. it and then playing it back. So, sure. you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I don't have a this is right or wrong answer to that. I'm just thinking it through, uh, you know, as, as a tangent to Greg's uh, question here in the thought experiment, but getting to his actual question. Uh, we have to realize that Let's say the recording includes some infrasonic frequency. It's there in the recording. If your subwoofer is capable of moving at that frequency and playing back uh, accurately to the signal, it does so. Does that mean that it doesn't have the additional power necessary to also play the audible frequencies that are happening at the same time? Because the time domain is what's important here, right? And again... When you combine whatever frequencies are, you take a little slice of time <laughs> and look at okay. the wave pattern, right? It is the sum of all sounds, all frequencies, all waves. It all sums together into a single wave form, right? That's right. So the worst thing that could happen if you did include infrasonic frequency playback is that you would have that infrasonic frequency, that sine wave at that very low frequency, contributing to the sum of all frequencies that are being played. And if that infrasonic frequency was some outlandishly loud amplitude, well then, yeah, the power is gonna be sent to the subwoofer driver in an attempt to play it back at that sound pressure level. But let's say it's you know some 15 hertz note that the signal has recorded at 90 decibels, and then you have a 20 hertz note that's playing back at 115 decibels. Does that mean that you're subtracting 90 decibels from 115 decibels? Does that mean you're subtracting however many watts it would take to produce 90 decibels of 15 hertz in order to produce 115 decibels of 20 hertz? No, it, it all sums together into a single wave pattern with a single mm. amplitude at any time slice that you're looking at. And it's whatever the highest amplitude is, that's the power that's needed. Right. You know, so, the, the, the feeling in the human brain is, is if I ask this speaker to make a, a, a deep, heavy sound it wasn't designed to make, uh -huh. that it's going to stress it and it's not going to make the higher frequencies as accurately. That's the that's what feels right in my head. Sure. I mean, that that is true of any frequency that is being requested at an amplitude beyond what the subwoofer can deliver, though. You're running right. into essentially either mechanical or electrical clipping in either mm. case. So could you have the scenario 
where if you did a Fourier transform and you were able to separate each of the individual sine waves for the little slice mm -hmm. of time you're looking at, and there's right. some, you know, 15 hertz frequency that's in there and a 20 hertz and a 25 hertz frequency, and they're all playing simultaneously and they're all cresting at the same time. So they would just add together and you would wind up with some much higher amplitude because of the contribution of that 15 hertz note than you would have with just the 20 hertz note and the 25 hertz note overlapping. There's now this additional 15 hertz note that is also cresting at exactly the same time and boosting that amplitude even higher. That, that's true. That, that could right. happen, right? Mm -hmm. It all depends on the timing, right? So if you have cresting waves of any given frequency that just so happen to all perfectly line up at a moment, they're all just going to add together. They're all just going to sum together and result in an overall amplitude that's higher than if you subtracted some of those frequencies entirely, okay. right? So the thought experiment is completely valid. Is, is there a scenario? Will it happen? It will happen at some point that the... Mm -hmm the existence and contribution of some infrasonic frequency is going to happen to line up with the crests of some other frequencies in, in some little slice of time. And that's going to result in a signal with an amplitude that's higher than if the infrasonic frequency wasn't part of the recording or if it were filtered out completely, right? Now, in my opinion, that's going to be few and far between. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not that because the infrasonic frequency is there that none of the other frequencies can play as loud or as distortion-free as they ought to. That isn't really what's happening. It's just that there will be times when the waves sum together in a form that because this even lower frequency is present, its amplitude is being added to other frequencies and resulting in an even higher amplitude in the signal than is really necessary. So uh, the idea of a rumble filter... <laughs> Yeah. is nothing new, right? right? In fact, we have rumble filters that begin well up into the audible part of the bass, right? We have rumble mm -hmm. filters that start at 32 hertz and introduce a pretty darn steep slope for everything below 32 hertz. And we know we can hear frequencies below 32 hertz, but right. for certain subwoofers that really struggle just mechanically to produce sounds below 32 hertz, introducing a rumble filter helps prevent them from just overworking themselves. from just Sort of an admission themselves. that we're not confident of the accuracy of any frequencies below That's right. said rumble you know, if, filter. If you're using some it, little 8-inch subwoofer with a 100-watt amplifier, chances right. are it's just not going to play 20 hertz at 100 decibels right no, so no. filter that off and you avoid that potential of bottoming out or producing distortion or whatever well, so let, there is validity to the idea just in the thought experiment of okay if i know my subwoofer is very capable of playing down to 20 hertz or 19 hertz but i don't know what it does when i send it 15 16 hertz you know you could run into the scenario where yeah there's a 15 hertz note that happens to be cresting right at the same time as a 20 hertz note and it creates this amplitude that if there's no protection on the driver will cause the driver to bottom out whereas if you filter out that 15 hertz note it's not going to bottom out simple as that the the, the yeah, waves I think that's just why won't pretty be much there to add together pretty much everything has that uh, low yes. end filter yeah. right <laughs> yeah. but it, it, this this brings up two two concepts in my head one this sounds like it, it, it's setting off my rabbit hole alarm sound like mm -hmm. you, the, you can go so deep into this you'll never come back again and then, <laughs> well so, I mean, it's a little bit more for the <laughs> diy subwoofer crowd i would say yeah right? yeah because like the subs that we're always recommending around here svs mono price and you know hsu and rhythmic as well like you know whether they're doing it via dsp or whether they're doing it via a servo feedback system or just a bash amplifier like they have those rumble filters in them in in some yeah. form or fashion they are protecting the driver so that it doesn't overexert itself that it doesn't you know produce so much um you know uh what's the what's the word for it anyway back and forth movement the word went yeah. out of my head excursion uh producing excursion, it so much that it, you yeah. know that it, it it reaches the physical limits of how far it can go uh -huh, they, they uh -huh. prevent that with filtering of some fashion but if you're doing this just on the diy side where you're picking your own driver putting it in your own box and attaching your own amplifier and not necessarily applying any filtering to it this notion of being like well if i know this is about how low it can go and if it tries to go beyond this amplitude curve i'm going to run into physical bottoming out or just horrible distortion yeah, having that rumble filter on the bottom yeah. of it is a darn good idea. It seems like good advice to never try to make a sound that no one can hear. So <laughs> I don't see the point. And secondly, which digital formats can possibly make that actually encode sounds below 20 hertz? 
Because as far my understanding oh, yeah. was like CDs, for instance, stop at twenty hertz, right? No, no. I mean, no? You, you you can go on down it there. Okay. There's a there's a high end limit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. You you Maybe it's because. I've always seen specs on CD players that say right, 20 right. to 20,000 hertz. Oh, sure. Yeah. And my assumption was, oh, they must cut it off at 20 hertz. Not necessarily. They're not always linear below 20 hertz. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I mean, like well, Blu-rays, there there's there's plenty of Blu-rays with, uh, you know, DTS HD master audio soundtracks that have information well below 20 hertz. All right. Right on. Uh, so shall we move on to actual new questions? Why don't we? We're only an hour in. Oh, halfway point. <laughs> Because everyone's in the two hour plus club. <laughs> right. <laughs> New for this week, Dylan has a question. Dylan's back with his recently finished basement where his theater area takes up the left half of the room, leaving the right half open for other uses. He'll be putting in an L shaped sectional that will go against the back wall and the left wall. His TV is on an articulated wall mount that can pull pull out almost four feet from the front wall. Wow. All of his speakers are wall mounted and he has a support column that is in a bit of an awkward location, basically in front of his front right speaker. Isn't that just always the case with basement <laughs> yeah. spaces? That so, really needs and, to be there though, because house falling down is worse than uh, a speaker having yes. a slight occlusion to some seats. <laughs> so yeah, I, man, my first instinct is pull those speakers forward. Uh, <laughs> so last time, Tom and Rob made some suggestions for things he could potentially do at the front of the theater area to better position his front speakers and maybe even create a false wall, which would allow him to visually hide a large bass trap. He'll consider all of that for the future. But one question he had in mind is right now, his center speaker's tweeter is about 28 inches from the ground. That's lower than ear level, but it needs to be below the TV and he wouldn't be keen to move the TV much higher. His front and surround speakers are all mounted a little bit higher than seated ear level. The tweeters of his front speakers are about 48 inches from the ground. So if he moves his front speakers in the future, should he lower them? Should his goal be to get their tweeters in line with his center speaker? So I suppose we should address that first. Again, when you talk about like what instinctively makes sense is, yeah, generally, if you can help it, you know, everything should be approximately the same height for the most convincing placement of sounds, but boy, your ears and brain do a wonderful job of uh, yeah. <laughs> telling you that the sound is coming from the screen. Yeah. So uh, I, I mean, wouldn't worry it, that much. If you do end up moving the front left and right speakers anyway, uh, 48 inches for the tweeter off the ground is almost certainly above seated ear height. I mean, uh, I'm not sure he doesn't have the L-shaped uh, sectional in there yet, so maybe it's a bit higher than the temporary seating that he's using right now. In fact, it probably certainly is because he's, uh, I think, using a futon right now, uh, which is, you know, generally those are lower. The seat is lower than uh, where a regular couch would be. But the general advice is, yeah, your front speakers, we want the tweeters of your front speakers to be at seated ear height. That's that's the general advice. Now, your center speaker's tweeter is still going to be below that, and that's fine. You know, yes, the theoretical idea is that all three of your front speakers would have their tweeters at the same height, which would be seated ear height. That's a theoretical idea, and some people get really hung up on that, and that's why they say you have to have an acoustically transparent screen. It's the only way you can reasonably put your center speaker's tweeter high enough that it would be at seated ear height, because otherwise your screen is going to be too too high if it goes below but uh, as tom has said many times as lee just said our ear eye brain system all works together to really convince us very well that the sounds are actually coming from the screen when we're looking at the screen uh, even when the center speaker is physically below the screen so i would just say that yeah i think your front left and right speakers are probably a bit higher than would be optimal how much you would hear that given the distance from them very debatable. Uh, but if you're going to end up moving them anyway, particularly if it's onto stands, like if you are going to do the false wall idea and those front left and right speakers end up on stands so that they can be, you know, slightly proud of that support column just in front of it, uh, mm -hmm. then you're probably going to end up with them lower anyway because uh, you're not going to have, you know, 40 inch tall stands in all likelihood. Right, right. I would put, I, I like everything level if you can help it, but it really doesn't ruin anything. It's, it, this is not the thing to lose sleep over whatsoever. No. Keep your center where it makes sense. I'm just saying the front left and right speakers probably are a touch high where they are right now, right. but again, not the end of the world. Sure, sure. His main questions were about acoustic treatment 
And we emphasized how, in his case, his focus should be on base trapping and basically adding absorption as thick as he can anywhere and everywhere that he can visually hide it. Uh, he was already planning to add hexagons on his back wall, along with curtains over the windows. So he will take our advice with those and make the curtains as thick as and, and as bunched up as possible. Mm -hmm. While the hexagons will be a mix of three and a half inch thick and four and a half inch thick. And he'll have 15 in total with them being 16 inches across. He'll be able to pull the sectional four just enough to accommodate the thickness of the hexagons and curtains, <laughs> but no more. He's already lost that battle. All right. That's still better than nothing. So I'm happy when about you, all of that. He has his limits set. Uh, he was then thinking that for the sidewalls, both the left wall of the theater area and the right wall way over in the open portion of the room, they wouldn't mind having a shelf about five feet off the floor. So under that shelf, he could construct a board and batten faults wall, essentially, that could be about five inches deep and covered with Acoustamac DMD fabric with the board and batten trim on top to make it all look like it belongs in the room. He could use rock wool insulation that's about three inches thick, and he also has some spare fiberglass insulation left over that he figured could fill the void behind the rock wool. Does that all sound like a good plan? And would the Acoustamac DMD fabric withstand being touched or bumped from time to time as his kids will probably do so? <laughs> I, I mean, again, f fill the room with pillows. <laughs> you know, everything is fine. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. There's that too. Yeah. Uh, but I like yeah. this idea very much. Sure. You know, this yeah. is going to visually fit in really nicely. The shelf is going to be useful. Uh, you know, it adds a type of, you know, almost like a wainscoting, a board and batten type of design on the side walls mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you would like anyway, just visually. I'm on board with all of this. I yeah. will let you know if you are doing a total void that is five inches deep and you're already going to have three or three and a half inch thick uh, rock wool insulation, you don't need to fill the air gap behind it. You know, that right. rock wool insulation and whatever framing you do, just make the framing like you would whatever standard, uh, you know, 16 inch on center or 24 inch on center, whatever the rock wool width is that you get. Uh, just make that frame, you know, just like a wall uh, so that the rock wool just sits in it like it would, you know, just a friction fit uh, into the framing like it would inside of any wall and leave the air gap. Leave the air gap behind it, the, yeah. you know, one and a half, two inch air gap. Uh, it isn't actually necessary to fill that air gap. The air gap works along with the insulation to perform essentially just as well as, you know, insulation all the way back. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can save yourself a little bit of uh, hassle and a little bit of expense by just leaving the air gap. But overall, I love the idea. I like yeah. that this is thicker than two inches. I like that you're covering an area in a way that's going to be useful and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, visually hidden. So I'm on board with all of that. The DMD fabric, I'm a big fan of uh, Acoustamax DMD fabric. It is uh, quite durable as far as acoustically transparent fabrics go. So I don't have a big concern uh, with using that particular <laughs> fabric for this purpose. But... If you stain it with a cheese whiz like cheese material, whiz, yeah. can you watch it? Uh, you I mean, if you it? make I, it removable, I suppose you could. Yeah, you can. You can launder the DMD fabric. So there you yeah. go. <laughs> For all your cheese whiz needs. Uh, <laughs> there's a corner in the little offshoot section of the room where the door is located where they'd like to install a corner shelf. The front of the shelf would be about 24 inches across, but then it would extend back into the corner, leaving a gap behind it that would be about nine inches deep and 18 inches across. Would there be any audible benefit from filling that corner gap behind the shelf with insulation. It would be a smaller triangle than the typical Git tri traps and definitely smaller than super chunks. So would it even move the needle? And it is kind of around the corner. Yeah. In a, like a little cubby shape off around the corner. I guess it I'm couldn't like, hurt, but would it make a difference? It can't hurt. <laughs> it yeah. can't hurt. Like my ah, thinking is, up. you were thinking you were going to use the leftover fiberglass insulation to fill the two-inch void on the side walls. That means, since you're going to leave that air gap, you're going to have some leftover fiberglass insulation. Why not put it in this corner? Because it can't hurt. Do I right. think this is going to make some gigantic audible difference in the room? I got to say, probably not. I don't think probably it's going to make some gigantic audible difference. Um, but honestly... As we mentioned, this is a scenario where 
anything as thick as you can anywhere you can is a benefit yeah. to this room. I mean, uh, in that so, case, just stuff it with an old bedspread. It's fine. <laughs> just <laughs> put, put right. anything back there. But I mean, particularly <laughs> if you're going to have that fiberglass insulation you thought was going to go on the sidewalls, just sitting around doing nothing, uh, yeah. I would absolutely just put that in the rear corner Why not? And, and visually cover it. I, I, 100% I would go ahead and do that. So I don't know if that's really genuinely going to be audibly different. I suppose you could go to the trouble of trying it with and without but my honest feeling is if you've got the material on hand just go ahead and do it because it cannot hurt sure sure i like dylan's setup so i, yeah. I think he's going to be really happy with this uh moving on to brad brad is a long time listener first time writing in brad recently moved to a bigger space he's got his tv and surround sound system set up in his new living room which is about 31 feet wide by 19 feet long that's a pretty good room. pretty big yeah his TV is more or less centered on the 31 foot front wall, but then there are openings on either side of the TV to the dining area and hallway. His seats are about 10 feet from his TV, which at the moment is an older 65 inch Vizio. Sounds like he needs uh, that gigantic hundred and something inch thing or that 97 inch wall mount. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and his sound system is a 5.1 setup using a Denon X3600H receiver, along with a pair of Outlaw monoblock amps to power a Sin Sierra Rawl Towers, Luna V2 surrounds, and a Duo V2 center, plus a single rhythmic F12 SE subwoofer. He mainly uses a Fire TV stick for streaming, plus he recently managed to get a PS5, and he also has a Nintendo Switch. He'd like to make some upgrades, but he wants to know the best order and what his smartest upgrade path would be. Should he start with the TV? Yes. He, uh, that's I, my, I mean, that I want way. to immediately say yes. This one, I'm, I'm leaning that way. Yeah. 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 yeah the, the space <laughs> he just described. He'd like to take full advantage of everything his PS5 can do. And his current Vizio isn't up to the task. He'd uh, love to get an OLED. Which one? The big one. Get yeah, as, the big as, as big OLED. as he can. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely get the would go 85 as big as... inch. Well, 83. What is it? It's 83. 83 yeah, that... 83 for the ones that are somewhat reasonably affordable because there is right. a 97 inch OLED. There's a G2. There's a G3 coming out. There's an M3 as well if you need it to only right, have right. a power cord. Uh, but you know the we know that the 97 inch <laughs> G2 was twenty five thousand dollars. Will the G3 right. so be? If you... <laughs> I mean, if you got that kind of cash, you know, from 10 feet yeah, away. Yeah, you got airplane money, go for it, yeah. Uh, absolutely not too big. But yes, get the biggest that you can. So anything from the C1 on up. So if you got an 83-inch C1 or C2 or the forthcoming C3, I think you'd be in excellent shape as far as supporting mm. everything that gaming systems can do. I don't know if he's planning to ever get an Xbox Series X, but if you want to be able to do Dolby Vision at 120 hertz with variable refresh rate, LG's OLED are the only ones we know can do that. Uh, we're okay. fingers crossed that 2023 Sony's coming up since they haven't announced anything mm -hmm. at CES as we said in the news. We're they hoping have their the own reason, special show. Yes. We're <laughs> hoping the reason that they're waiting to announce is that they're waiting for the newest MediaTek chips that will let them do Dolby Vision at 120 hertz with VRR. But we know for a fact that the LGs can and you could go get a C1 or a C2 today uh, and it will be a stellar yeah television for gaming including at the 83 inch size you can get them down at about four thousand dollars now so that's not necessarily that's pretty reasonable for an 83 inch 83 oled inch image OLED that good literally gracious. does all the things that a gaming system can do so i would definitely right. take a look at that and should that be the first thing that you upgrade in here well i know that if Tom were here, he would ask about the acoustic treatment situation because, yes, this is a room that is honestly, with Huge, including yeah. the openings, large enough you could have literal echoes. Like if every surface in your house is hard and flat and reflective, which is not mm. out of the question with today's architecture right, and design, right. if that's the case, the worst part of your system might be the acoustics that, that is not out yeah. of the question i don't know exactly what his room design is like now on the other hand if you're in a large open space but it is you know fairly plushly treated so that at least it it, it doesn't literally echo whatsoever 
if mm. if you're wondering, you can just do a short, hard clap with your hand and just like listen. <laughs> do, do you hear a zing? Yes. Do you hear a, a literal echo coming back at you? Because if you're getting anything close to a literal echo or an obvious reverberation just from a simple clap test, I would have to agree with what I know would be Tom's first line of thinking, which is, well, that's that's a problem, right? right. You can live yeah, with yeah, a yeah. TV that's too small and doesn't do all the gaming things. It's unpleasant to have a surround sound system in a in a truly bad acoustic environment. So we don't know. We don't know what the case really is. Right. Uh, but the notion that treating the acoustics as your very first priority is not out of the question whatsoever. But if you do the clap test... It's reasonable. You're not getting a bad zing. You're not getting a bad echo. It's comfortable to hold a conversation in this living room. uh, And you're never straining to hear what other people are saying when you're talking in there. Then I would say TV first. (laughs) Yeah. I I feel like those are such different things that the treating a room ought to always be the first thing you do. Even before you have a television? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) You know? Yeah. So, yes. Treat the room first. Then go buy the giant television. Uh, and, and then he moves on to ask about other audio things. Mm-hmm. Does he need to upgrade his Denon X 3600H receiver? As he understands it, it can't handle everything his PS5 can do. Is that correct? Uh, so it's correct in the sense that if you were to plug the PS5 into one of the X 3600H's HDMI ports, uh, it can't pass through 4K 120. It can't pass through that signal. Uh, mm-hmm. it, You need an HDMI 2.1 port to do that, and the X3600H does not have any. Uh, The X3700H had one, (laughs) and uh, and that would work fine with the PS5, plugging the PS5 into an X3700H, and now we're up to the X3800H, which all of its HDMI inputs are HDMI 2.1. So you could plug a PS5 into any port of an X3800H. But what you can do with your X3600H, assuming you get a new television, particularly an LG OLED, is you Mm. could use eARC. You could use the enhanced audio return channel, which your X3600H does have. It does have enhanced audio return channels. So in that connection path, you would plug the PS5 directly into your new LG OLED, and then you would Mm. rely on the eARC to send the audio out of the television into the Denon, and that is capable of transmitting everything in terms of audio that the PS5 is capable of outputting. Okay. Uh, the one exception being if you were to use your PS5 as a Blu-ray player. Right? If you're using it as a Blu-ray disc player, the LG OLEDs will not send through any sort of DTS audio signal. So a lot of regular Blu-rays, of course, were DTS HD master audio, uh, and that isn't going to make it through the eARC connection path. Uh, so if you're planning to use the PS5 as a disc player, as a Blu-ray disc player for movies, uh, and you get an LG OLED, do be aware that DTS audio isn't going to work. You're going to have to rely on Dolby signals, so you might go all the way back to Dolby Digital 5.1 for a lot of Blu-rays, if that's what's going on. Uh, but but in you terms can of, solve that with a separate Blu-ray player. You can solve that with much. a separate Blu-ray player that plugs directly into the den. <laughs> that. Right. Right, that right, is right. the other, you know, fairly easy solution there. But that just just to be aware of in case you're like, okay, why doesn't that thing work? Because that's not necessarily something you're going to think ahead of time. Uh, so, but in terms of getting all the audio that would be used in any games, that will all work via eARC. Okay, so so far it sounds like we're getting the big TV first. Yeah, I don't think uh, you need to upgrade that receiver. It's it's a you know right. we don't love eARC because sometimes there's some quirks with it because HDMI CEC has to be on in order for eARC to yeah, work, and yeah. we we dislike hdmi cec but compared to the price of getting a brand new (laughs) receiver you can live with you know just using eARC it's not that bad no not that bad not not worth upgrading that right yet uh he has considered the idea of switching out his sierra raw towers for ascend's new sierra lx speakers where should that fall on his priority list how different is that how big a difference would that make yeah i i i wouldn't do that um okay don't do it uh, just don't do it at all yeah, I, I wouldn't go for okay. the LX. Now, he he did put in like a SLX or an ELX or something. So I'm wondering if he actually meant the Sierra 2EX, right? Because mm-hmm. there's a Sierra 2EX and there's a Sierra LX. The mm. LX uses a dome tweeter, a completely mm. different tweeter design than the Raoul ribbon tweeters. Now, his surrounds are the Lunas, which use Raoul ribbon tweeters. His center is the Duo, which uses a Raoul ribbon tweeter. It wouldn't make sense to me to switch to front, left, and right 
LX speakers that use so zone tweeters. So he might have meant the other. He yes. might have meant the two EX. Now that is just a form factor change. That's just going from towers to a bookshelf version. Uh, yeah. And I wouldn't have any problem with that. Um, you know, so so if you were going to make this change because you just wanted the bookshelf form factor rather than the tower form factor, I'd be totally fine with you getting the Sierra 2 EX. Uh, you could also get a pair of Sierra Duos in their vertical orientation instead of the horizontal orientation that you already have for the center. And then you would have three identical speakers across the front with three mm. Duos, two of them positioned vertically and one of them positioned horizontally as the center. But that is another option uh, if you wanted to do that but i wouldn't go to the lx uh so assuming that wasn't just a typo in his email that wouldn't be on my priority list at all i would maybe switch to one of the rowl ribbon tweeter bookshelf models so we're still getting the tv first yep so far <laughs> all right he's been considering getting a second sub mm. okay now this now gets this. interesting yes yes, yes, yes. <laughs> mm. <laughs> overall the sound in his new place is much improved over his old place yeah so i wonder if that means it's less echoey too yeah but he can definitely tell if he walks around his new living room that the bass is way louder in some spots and way quieter in others. Mm -hmm. If the room remains the way it is for now, with the two large openings on either side of the TV, can adding a second sub still improve the uniformity of the base? I believe it could. Yes, it can. It's just not as easy to predict exactly where the two subwoofers ought to be positioned mm -hmm. in the room relative to one another and the seats. You know, if you've got an enclosed rectangle, it's pretty easy to predict where those two subwoofers ought to go. Uh, but in a more open, irregular shape, it's not as easy to predict where the two subwoofers are going to go. But if you want to have better uniformity where it isn't obviously louder in some parts of the room and obviously quieter in others uh, when bass is playing, adding a second subwoofer is the only reasonable solution. That There is no way to avoid that phenomenon when using a single subwoofer. You're just going to have that happen with any single subwoofer in any room, regardless of what the openings or the shape are. You're going to have that with any single subwoofer where from place to place as you walk around the uh, amplitude of the bass changes significantly uh, with the mm -hmm. frequency. So adding a second sub is the only solution. Uh, I did have to think, though, that you know the sub that he has right now for the size of room that he has, even if he didn't have the openings to other parts of the house, just the 19 by 31 square footage That's is larger than his sealed rhythmic sub because he's got a sealed rhythmic yeah, sub, which is a really okay. nice sub but it doesn't have the output capability to contend with your room size. So my inclination right. here would be that if you do want to do a subwoofer upgrade, I'm still going to say on the priority list, I would probably get the bigger TV first. Uh, yeah, I think I'm you're gonna... still going TV first yeah, because that's so going to uh, be this, the biggest effect on your life right away. This very well might be second. In terms of equipment Definitely. purchases, yep. this would be yep. second. Yep. But I would strongly consider the idea of selling the subwoofer that you have right now as nice as it is or mm -hmm. utilizing it in a different room of the house uh, and getting yourself two new subwoofers that have greater output capability to better contend with the space that you're dealing with. Right, because he's living in an Amazon warehouse, so I... <laughs> Not quite, but... <laughs> <laughs> Compared to my living room. But. Right. <laughs> uh, in theory, sliding barn style doors could be added because they're so cool to close <laughs> off the hallway and dining room openings. Would that be worth it? How sealed would doors actually need to be in order to consider the living room enclosed? I, I would say right away, more sealed than a barn style door. I mean, I you know, the, they, the... most of those don't you know, get tight anywhere around. No, I mean, they're, they're certainly yeah. not airtight and I don't think you'd want it to be because that, that gets into a whole HVAC thing as well because chances right. are you don't have both air supply and return just within the living room. The air return is probably in the hallway if yeah, we're going right. by normal architecture. So there needs to be an air path for the air to be able to get out of the room. There's probably air registers putting air into the living room. I'd expect that, but the air return back to your furnace and your HVAC is probably I in the hallway. Um, so yeah, this thing to consider with that so you probably wouldn't want an airtight seal anyway i mean 
any door, right? Close your bedroom door. Does it make a difference to the sound yeah. transmission? Yes, sure. it does. You know, hollow core with a gap under it, it still makes a difference. So, right, I mean, right. when we're talking about bass frequencies bouncing off of surfaces and more of that sound wave reflecting back into the room where it came from versus escaping outside of the room, barn style doors would make a very significant difference in terms sure. of measuring. Just make sure they're close. They're not, you know, because I've seen a lot of them that have such a gap. Sure. But I've seen people put barn style doors that had like a, a really fat gap in front of a bathroom. And I'm like, right. uh, I can see around, I can I'm see not around a, a corner. You know, you got to be really <laughs> careful with any barn style sliding doors because they can rattle. That yeah. would be much worse. Having doors rattling on you would be much worse than just leaving the opening. Are yeah. there really well built and therefore expensive sliding barn style doors that don't yeah. rattle even when 20 hertz is going off? They do exist. They're not They'd cheap. They're heavy. Heavy. They're heavy. They're uh, damped, right? The rollers are damped uh, to damp the vibrations. It's a, it's a to-do. It's a deal. Um, right. So usually the reason we'd be more concerned about that is not so much the performance inside the living room, but more about trying to prevent some of the sound transmission to other parts of the house. If that isn't a concern... Right. If you're not really worried about sound getting out of the living room when you're watching a movie in there and being audible throughout the rest of the house, if that's okay uh, in your living situation, this, I mean, even though, you know, we're always talking about rectangular enclosed rooms, like it wouldn't be my top priority. It'd be a higher priority if the only way you're ever going to get to watch anything in the living room is if you cut down the noise and then we're going to want to get even closer to some kind of airtight seal if we can. Uh, but so far, mm -hmm. I'm thinking. If your acoustics actually sound pretty good, he's saying it sounds better than where he was before, so I'm guessing right, it's not right. a literal echo chamber in there. I'm still thinking that, yes, treating the room as much as you reasonably can, we always mm, want to do that. Mm. We always, always want to do that. But then it's going to be the TV, and there's going to be TV. two new subwoofers. <laughs> I two think that's, new your, subwoofers. that's your priority list. You've already that's got the order of speakers, events. Yeah. so unless you just really don't like having the tower form factor, that'd be really far down on my list. Okay, there we go. That sounds like a good plan. I want to I want to see pictures of this giant room yeah. with his giant TV because I'm kind of excited about the sound of that. Uh, moving on to Eric. Eric says that typically when he's in his theater that he's got set up in his detached garage, he's got all the lights off. But recently, he was just listening to some music, so he had the lights on. And he noticed that during some particularly loud passages, his lights actually dimmed. <laughs> Yeah. Subs and amps, man. Subs <laughs> and amps. <laughs> There's a little electrical breaker box in the t detached garage. And while he can chuckle at the obvious, then don't turn the lights on answer. We didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> he's concerned now that maybe this could be having an impact on his projector. So is this something he needs to address? Kind of. And short of calling in an electrician, could some sort of power conditioner thingy resolve this at least for his projector if so what should he get yeah this is Definitely. an interesting one so i mean we, yeah. we we usually do say yeah try to have your lights and your electrical outlets on separate circuits uh that doesn't seem to be the case <laughs> in nope. your detached garage which is not a surprise because it's a single room where there's probably literally a single dual gang electrical circuit uh right. being fed in there uh so your lights and all of your electrical outlets are all on the same circuit so when there's a big power draw from any electrical outlet it's enough to impact your lights, uh, which mm. means, yes, it would impact your projector. Now, your projector has a power supply in it that's designed to work within a range of voltages. You know, it'll mm -hmm. say 115 on it, but there's a pretty good leeway on either side of that where it still works well. If you've literally never, ever noticed any sort of dimming in your image, chances are it's not actually any sort of right, problem. Right. Uh, that said, I am never going to say no to adding a battery backup to any sort of projection system. I think it's always a good idea to have a battery backup. So the ones we like are from APC. Uh, they're called their Gaming Performance Series. That's the ones you want to get. It's pure sine wave output from the battery, and it has voltage regulation. So it would take care of any momentary sags like this. Uh, that would not 
uh, uh, impact your projector then. It will keep that voltage very steady, very much within the range that is tolerated by the projector, no problem whatsoever. And in the event of a momentary blackout or brownout, it'll keep the power going to your projector and you can safely power it down and keep its cooling fan going and all of those good things so that your bulb never explodes on you. Uh, so right. the one I think is the best value from that APC gaming performance lineup is the BR1350MS that usually has the best discounts over at BNH Photo or on Amazon. So that's the one I like. And I'll point you to the BR1350MS from APC. You know, he's probably just a little bit proud that his audio dims his lights. I think so. I mean, Who I wouldn't, wouldn't be. be. <laughs> uh, he's got to send CMT340 front speakers, the original non-SE versions. That means his center is a horizontal MTM design. So uh, uh, a mid-range or woofer mid driver, the tweeter in the middle centered, and then another mid-range or woofer driver on the other side of it. Right, right. He's been considering an upgrade, including to Ascend's newest CMT340 SE2 models, but that would still be an MTM center, mm -hmm. and he's concerned that for an upgrade, he should be looking for a three-way center with a dedicated mid-range driver positioned vertically below the tweeter, such as SVS's designs. Mm -hmm. How beneficial is it to have the three-way design for a center speaker, and does it have something to do with how wide your seating area is? <laughs> so this is one of those things that gets overgeneralized, uh, you know, in audio enthusiast circles. So a lot of this all comes from the idea of if you took a vertical MTM speaker, that's called a Dapolito array. And in a vertical MTM speaker that is actually a Dapolito array, uh, they use the fact that at whatever frequency the tweeter crosses over into those two uh, woofers on mm -hmm. the top and bottom of that tweeter, right in that range where all three of those drivers are actually producing the same frequencies in that crossover region. Mm -hmm. They, uh, like, intentionally utilize some interference between all three of those drivers to limit the vertical dispersion of the speaker. Mm -hmm. It's okay. to reduce some of the sibilant sounds in vocals from bouncing off your ceiling and floor. It's an intentional okay. design to do that. Now, one of the issues is if you just take that speaker designed that way and turn it horizontally... Well, it's well, going to not get out to the side. It's not going to go out to the sides, <laughs> right? Right. Like, That's not you know, good. So... This, unfortunately, is very common. A lot of center speakers are exactly that. They began with a woofer, tweeter, woofer, vertical monitor speaker, and then mm -hmm. they did nothing besides turn it on its side and rotate the logo on the grill, right? They made no other mm -hmm. design changes. And that does mean that it's horizontal dispersion now, right in that sibilant vocal range where all three of those drivers are crossing over, has very narrow dispersion, <laughs> which isn't great for a center speaker. We want the center speaker to have nice, wide, horizontal dispersion to at right. least cover your sofa, right? So this now idea- Now I'm instantly suspicious of my MT M center speaker <laughs> underneath my TV. I'm like, hey, well, right, what's right. it been keeping from me? But I, I don't know. Now, now, now I'm going to think about that. If you only care about one seat that's directly in front of that speaker on axis, mm -hmm. not going to matter. So how wide your seating area is does have some impact. If it's a single seat directly in front of the center, it doesn't really matter what the driver design is because you're going to get that on axis response and you're not so worried about the horizontal dispersion. But if you have a fairly wide seating area, then we do care about it. So, But I if, assume if the crossovers are designed thus, you can you keep go. that from happening. That's exactly the case. Right. So if you know ahead of time that what you are designing is a horizontally oriented center speaker, you can do an MTM design as long as you are careful with the crossover. And Ascend and Dave Fabricant, the founder and designer over at Ascend, is very careful with his crossover designs. The horizontal center version of the CMT340 SE2 is not identical to the vertical ones. It has a different right. crossover in it exactly for this reason. So that? as long as it's carefully designed, having MTM is not intrinsically a bad design for a center speaker, but it does have to be carefully designed and you can't just take one that was meant to be vertical and intentionally limits the vertical dispersion in that mm. crossover area and just mm. turn it horizontally and think you're going to get right. good horizontal results. So I don't have any worries about getting a CMT340 SE2 center. I would have a worry of buying a pair of the vertical main left and right ones and just turning it on its side. That I wouldn't do. 
You want to get specifically the center if you do it. The three-way design that SVS and Paradigm and others use is also very good, right? That's taking the uh, tweeter and dedicated mid-range driver, aligning them vertically so that you get good whole, wide horizontal dispersion through that whole range, and you're pushing the area where it crosses over to the two woofers on either side way down into the upper uh, base or the lower mid-range where you're not going to have those sort of directional problems and interference mm. as it goes out to the sides. So it's another way of addressing that. Another way you could do it is with a, uh, a coaxial or a concentric driver like yeah, what Kef yep, uses, yep. right? Kef we'll put the tweeter in the middle of the of the woofer, right? You and can turn that any angle work. you want to. It should be the same, right? That's right. So there's multiple ways of uh, going after this problem, but the MTM design is fine as long as the crossover is properly designed and the specifically the center speaker version of a Sen CMT340 SE2 is properly designed with a crossover that addresses this. So you don't have to worry that it's an MTM layout, you know, just visually. So in other words, you know, from a good manufacturer, it's fine. That's right. It's fine. Yeah. But yes. it's it's true that there are many that just took the vertical one and turned it sideways yep. and did nothing besides rotate the logo on the grill. Well, my speakers are old and they're Yamahas from a long time ago. It's not I impossible. Yeah, that. I mean, <laughs> I ran into, when I was looking for on-wall speakers, I came across that up from everybody. It was really disappointing. And it wasn't until I found Revels where yeah. it looks identical to the vertical ones, but what they did is actually turned it into a two and a half way design and they put both of the mid ranges uh, to one side of the tweeter and both of the base only ones to the other side of the tweeter specifically okay. for the center version and that avoided this horizontal comb yeah. filtering and lobing problem, whereas the vertical ones, it was identical drivers top and bottom. So How about that, they made that design difference in the center specific version. Continuing on to our next questioner, Andrew. So, Apple Music is available on Xbox One and Xbox Series XS now. Mm -hmm. And if you set the audio output of the Xbox to Dolby Atmos Bitstream, the front panel of his AV receiver says it's playing Atmos. Yep. But is it really? <laughs> <laughs> Do the Xbox consoles actually support Apple's spatial audio with Atmos for Apple Music? Or... Is that only on the Apple TV 4K and other Apple devices? What is the Xbox doing when it comes to <laughs> Apple Music? Is it up mixing? Ooh, those are some detailed. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so. so is it really <laughs> doing what it says? <laughs> right. So directly from Apple support, uh, let's see. The only devices that are not an Apple device that are actually sending the spatial audio with Atmos from the Apple Music service are Android phones, mm. okay? Not happening on Windows PCs, it's not happening on your Xbox, <laughs> and it's mm. not happening on your Amazon Fire TV or your Roku or your NVIDIA Shield or any other devices. So your Xbox is not actually delivering Apple Music's spatial audio with Atmos. Okay. It's not. That's just not part of the service at this time. Maybe that'll change in the future, but according to Apple's own support, it is not doing that. So with the Xbox Series X, uh, it does give you the option of let my AV receiver decode the audio that even works from its built-in streaming services. So if you check that box it will switch formats depending on what the bitstream actually is. So that'll be your indication that it isn't coming out in Atmos anymore when you play Apple Music if you check that uh, box that says, let my AV receiver decode the audio, and therefore it's sending out the original bitstream. The Xbox messes up all the time with that <laughs> setting, so it's very annoying to leave it in that setting because mm. it screws up and drops out the center channel entirely and does all other kinds of weirdness until you reboot it because it's a computer that's flaky as all heck when it comes to audio formats. Uh, it's but not acceptable. <laughs> no, which is why most of us pick a format and leave it in that format. And right. in his case, he's chosen Dolby Atmos Bitstream, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Now, okay. Originally, the Xbox would just take whatever the audio is, whether it's stereo or 5.1 or 7.1 or actually Atmos, and it would just stick it in an Atmos container and send it out. So your AV receiver would say Atmos. 
Atmos on the front panel, Mm -hmm. because that's Mm -hmm. the signal container that's coming out of the Xbox, but you might have sounds coming from nothing besides your front left and right speakers if the original signal was a stereo signal. That has changed now. You have to actually do this setting in the, uh, I forget the exact name of the, as the Dolby app in the Xbox. I forget what the exact name of the Dolby app is, but there's a Dolby app in the Xbox, which you needed to download in order to activate Atmos anyway, so you must have it, even if you've never opened it since then. But in that app, there's an option, a little checkbox to enable up mixing. Mm -hmm. So if you do that, it will apply the Dolby Surround up mixer to any signals that were not originally already Atmos. Okay. It doesn't tend to put any sound in your surround back speakers. I don't know why. Just doesn't tend to. Your surround back speakers are usually sitting there silent (laughs) if the original signal was not Dolby Atmos, even with the up mixing activated. So I don't know what's going on there. Maybe they think up mixing means mix it up physically (laughs) to the the ceiling. Xboxes Up do all mixing. kinds of stupid stuff when it comes to audio, but I mean, it's it's a well, mess. It's Microsoft. <laughs> it's an absolute mess. Uh, but yeah, you're looking in multiple different places for multiple different checkboxes. But the, the short answer is, if you want to use your home system to play back Apple Music with spatial audio with Atmos, get an Apple TV 4K. That's the easy answer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Shall we move on to Infinite Gary? I mean, I think we must. You're here. I know. Every time I'm here, it's Infinite Gary time. Uh, CES 2023 has begun, he says, Mm -hmm. and trumpets blared. Is this an evolution or a revolution kind of year? Any AV products we should all be super excited about, or is this more of a carryover year with only minor improvements to existing product lines? You know, I think it's been a long time since we had a full revolution kind of year where something was just brand new and amazing and blew our minds. I mean, I don't last if... year we had Quantum Dot OLEDs coming to consumers for the first time, so that, that was, was kind of something. That was kind of a new thing. Yeah. Uh, what what constitutes a revolution, really? I mean, we're I mean, talking earlier first, about we've... the first OLEDs, you know, like yeah, like plasmas just going away entirely, and the first OLED showing up like that was a. A revolution in display technology. I mean, honestly, micro LED is going to be a revolution in display technology. And and CES gives us the glimpse of what's to come. Mm. Uh, So I would, I think I would have to classify this year as more of an evolution. But I think there are significant evolutions. It's a strong evolution kind of year. Yeah. You know, because I mean, strong evolution. It's still. (laughs) LG displays W OLEDs, but this new micro lens array technology yeah. has 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 significantly evolved that technology. It's not a revolution. It's not a brand new from the ground up technology, but it has significantly evolved it. What Samsung Display has done with their QD OLED panels is a significant evolution in my mm-hmm. eyes, but not a revolution because we had QD OLEDs last year. Right. Uh, micro LEDs have improved. They have evolved, but... They have existed for six years now, so can't call that a revolution. So we're not getting like some brand new codec, you know, ATSC 3.0 has existed for quite a while now and still hasn't fully rolled out. So it's not like there's, you know, a brand new broadcast format happening. Um, Yeah, so I I don't think we can call it a revolutionary year, but I would say it's there's some strong evolution that's happened. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, So there's our infinite Gary question. It is. I liked it. (laughs) All right, here comes Mike. Mike and his wife made the decision to go with an 83-inch OLED, like we were talking about before, yeah. <laughs> sitting nine feet away instead of a 120-inch ultra-short throw setup sitting 11 feet away. They got a Sony A90J, and while Mike loves the perfect black levels, he does miss the wow factor of the sheer size that the ultra-short throw setup offered. His that wife, is always going to be the trade-off. <laughs> That is. That's just part of it. I mean, there is something viscerally different about a projected that's image. That's right. It's true. Yeah. Uh, his, his wife, however, actually prefers the smaller screen size. So overall, they're both happy with this purchase. It works out from two different directions. Here. Thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> so on the audio side, he still has his Marantz AV7. I'm, I don't know if you call oh, this a 70,005. I, I, I added it should an extra two. zero in there. I was about 7, to say, it yes. did not look right. <laughs> he still has his Marantz AV7005, not 70,005 pre-pro. <laughs> right. 
with his Sunfire amplifiers and a 5.2 speaker configuration. His new Sony OLED can do pretty much all of the newest video things, uh, Dolby Vision, VRR, 4K 120, etc. His Marantz can't pass through any of that. Mm-hmm. His most used source is his NVIDIA Shield TV Pro, so he resorted to plugging that straight into the TV to get 4K and HDR and Dolby Vision, but that means using HDMI ARC to get the audio back to the Marantz. And of course, lossless audio didn't work this way. No Dolby True HD or DTS HD Master Audio. Yes, yeah, so his Marantz AV7005 uh, Pre-Pro is old enough that it does not have eARC. It does not have the enhanced audio return channel. Right. It has the original audio return channel, which had the same capabilities as our optical audio connection, our SPDIF connection. So you're not going to get lossless audio that way. Mm-hmm. So... Is it simply time for a new AV receiver or pre-pro? He doesn't envision upgrading his speaker configuration anytime soon. But if he didn't, he doesn't think he'd go beyond 7.2. Eh, you might right, might be right there at it. Uh, he's he, He'd really like to continue using his Sunfire amps, so he'd be looking for something with pre-outs. If he does expand beyond 5.2, he'd be fine using a receiver's built-in amps for any additional channels beyond the main five. But... It seems like it costs a bunch extra just to get even 5.1 pre outs. Yeah. Yeah. And they just bought a big new TV. So is <laughs> they there did. a Yeah, very nice. So is there a more cost effective solution? And if not, which AV receiver would we recommend to him? There are multiple ways to do everything. <laughs> yeah. So I mean the trick is when you are dealing with a um uh, like particularly an HDMI 2.1 source. So like in the case of his NVIDIA Shield TV Pro, that's HDMI 2.0. That's 18 gigabits per second at the most. Uh, There are going to be a few different ways that you could handle that. If you're going to maybe get a PS5 or an Xbox Series X uh, and take advantage of of HDMI 2.1 and the 40 gigabits of bandwidth that are coming out of those uh, video game systems, then it becomes a little bit more challenging. So what we're talking about here is if you were to keep the pre-pro that you have, you're going to need some kind of device that can just separate the 4K HDR Dolby Vision video Video from the lossless audio and send okay. just the lossless audio to your existing AV receiver and send just the 4K HDR Dolby Vision video to the television. Gotcha. Okay. Now, there are just HDMI audio extractors that can do that for HDMI 2.0. Uh, so you could look for that simply. Now, I do appreciate HD Fury. Uh, they're rock solid. Mm-hmm. They've actually added a whole graphic user interface to their things now, so they're much oh. easier to set up than they yeah. ever used to be. Okay. Uh, and if you're really only worried about your NVIDIA Shield TV Pro, you could go with the Integral 2. Now, it's $270, but that's a lot less than any AV receiver for yeah. all the features that you want. But that is a device where... Um, you know, it's really just meant for two sources. You'd only be able to plug two sources into the Integral 2, uh, and then you'd be able to separate the video and audio output from those two sources. Mm-hmm. If you needed to do a similar thing, but you want to do it for HDMI 2.1, uh, the least expensive device that HD Fury sells that can do that for a single source is called the 8K Arcana. That goes for $350. If you want the one that can do it all, which is switch between four different sources all the way up to four HDMI 2.1 sources if you want to, and then output the audio and video separately, so a switch and an audio splitter, that's the HD Fury 8K Vroom, (laughs) V-R-R-O-O-M, Vroom, which goes for $550. So now we're getting into... You know, you might be looking at only a few hundred dollars more to get yourself Mm. an AV receiver, right? So Mm -hmm. if you're really only worried about the uh, NVIDIA Shield uh, as your source and maybe one other source, uh, and it isn't so much that you need to worry about HDMI 2.1, I think the the HD Fury Integral 2 at $270 is a pretty reasonable uh, add-on to this system Mm -hmm. because that's definitely less expensive than an AV AV receiver you might consider. Now, if you just want to get uh, a very similar feature set to what you have with your AV7005, but get an AV receiver that could go to 7.2 um, and has a full set of pre-outs. Over at Accessories for Less, you could get Marantz's SR5015. 
All right. Mm. Now that mm-hmm. came out about a year and a half ago. It has a single HDMI 2.1 input, uh, but he didn't even mention having any any HDMI 2.1 sources at all. But right, it has right, the right. one, so you could you could plug in an Xbox Series X or a PS5. Uh, and over at Accessories for Less is nine hundred dollars. So. I'm like, that's not bad, you know? Especially if he can sell off another one. Uh, Oh, sell off what his AV7005. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, Now, if you're buying it brand new, it still is going for $1,500. So, yeah, but let me tell you something about a man, accessories for less. That's that's, right. That's where it's at, yo. (laughs) And so, I mean, I love that. As far as like, that's the same level of Odyssey that you already have, full set of pre outs. So, you're not worried that, yeah, you know, the the amps that are built into the SR5015 are not as powerful as your Sunfire amps, but full set of pre outs. So, not really an issue and a pretty reasonable price. So, Mm. using that as your new pre pro. Not a bad way to go if you wanted to get something that's right up to date, right? AV receiver that's right up to date, can do all the things, can switch as many HDMI 2.1 sources as it has ports. Uh, I would point you to Denon's X3800H. Uh, that can go all the way up to 11 speakers if you want to <laughs> with wow. its full 11.2. But he's not going 2. to do that, is he's he? He's not going to do it, but you know, <laughs> he's not it gonna can. not going to do that. Uh, and yeah. that goes for fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, at accessories for less, it's seventeen hundred dollars brand new. If you're just getting it MSRP, so mm-hmm. significant price increase there. But that would be a model really that does all there. the things. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, there is one interesting one, which is that Marantz's brand new for 2022 because they they just came out at the very end of 2022 mm-hmm. uh, slimline receiver. It's now the Cinema 70s. Uh, goes for twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> it is seven point two, hmm. uh, but hmm. the slim line now has a full set of preouts. They used to only have front, left, and right preouts, uh, but oh, now okay. the slim line Cinema Seventy S has a full set of preouts. And it's got three HDMI two point one ports and another three HDMI two point zero ports. Uh, but twelve hundred bucks. But if you just like the slim form factor, maybe it's not out of the question to go with that because uh, that has a full set of preouts now. But I would probably. Since you just spent a bunch of money, take a good hard look at that SR5015 because it actually does all the things you need, is I right like up to date a lot, with yeah. all the new formats. And maybe you go 5.2.2 and you actually have Atmos light up on the front of that thing and you can do that. Yeah. I like that idea a lot because yeah. he could sell the one he has now. Yeah. And then yeah. however much he gets for that offsets that yeah. and it's all still one unit. I like that idea a lot. And I just, I love the... Uh, the the used or slightly scratched or sometimes just oh, simply returned even, yeah. stuff fully like I, the, refurbished the, oh shoot yeah the re, the receiver i bought from them was immaculate yeah. i couldn't find anything wrong with it yeah. like why is this half price <laughs> i'm so right. confused <laughs> whatever uh so yeah that sounds like a good option great uh all right let's move on to uh kieran in india and then i think i might have to skip out on you if that's doke. okay that's probably pretty good uh, we might could do a couple. Let's see. Uh, Kieran in India wonders whether subwoofers that have dual opposed drivers, SVS's 3000 micro would be an example, are genuinely beneficial or if they're actually an unnecessary design. He's read how having two active subwoofer drivers firing in opposite directions from either side of the subwoofer cabinet offers force cancellation and lower distortion as a result. But none of that is the same as having two separate subwoofers, right? put a dual driver subwoofer in a spot that creates a null and it's still going to have a null just like a single driver sub won't it yeah that is true yes yes he's also seen the subwoofers that have two active drivers stacked one above the other and both firing forward what's the thinking there in both of these cases, wouldn't it be simpler, less complex, and less expensive to just use a single subwoofer driver and if you need more output, just get a second one Okay, all logical thoughts. Where are we going yeah. on this? Uh, so, I mean, if you take any single subwoofer driver, uh, that is, well, any single subwoofer driver, yeah. um, you know, when it's really moving, there there is just physical vibration of the cabinet. Uh, even mm-hmm. if it's down firing, there's going to be like, if you just put your hand on the cabinet of any single subwoofer driver and you really blast it, uh, there's going to be physical vibration that you can feel, yep. you know, put a put a full drink on the top of there. It's going <laughs> to spill. That's just yeah. going to happen. Uh, if you use the dual opposed design, so you have two powered drivers on opposite sides of the subwoofer cabinet and they both fire out at the same time and they both pull in at the same time. So it's not a mm. push pull design. It's a push push. They both go out. They both the come push, in. Push. 
at the same time. <laughs> That's right. All right um, yeah. If you do that, it actually does just mechanically cancel a lot of that vibration. Not usually 100% entirely, but to the point that you can sit a full drink on top of that subwoofer, have it blasting away, and the drink probably won't spill. You might see a few little ripples in the liquid, uh, but it probably won't spill the way a single subwoofer driver was. So when they're talking about force cancellation, that has nothing to do with sound. They're not talking about sound wave cancellation. We're talking about physical movement cancellation <laughs> that's okay, it, right you know it's it's an active damping device in the sense that you know uh, equal and opposite forces right so if you normally have just the one driver pushing its way out and pulling its way in and that's going to move the entire cabinet opposite to the movement of the driver well if you have another identical driver on the other side doing the exact opposite movement then those two forces cancel each other out like mechanically but does cancel it each other out. sound better does it I mean, sound better? Uh, not then, usually. Then, it, 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 yeah, is, I, it is about the mechanical cancellation, right? So in a case of something like the 3000 Micro, which is this teeny tiny, not particularly heavy subwoofer, right. if that were a single little 8-inch driver with the 800-watt amplifier that they've got powering it, it would start to walk itself across the room. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's actually like... It's beneficial in the sense that it it keeps it physically where you want it. Okay, like it, that makes it's sense. Not, it's okay. not literally shaking itself. So there right. is a benefit to that. So when we're talking about this force cancellation and that, and and um, you know, wouldn't it be uh, better to have two separate subwoofers across the room? I mean, those are two entirely different things. This this yeah, force yeah. cancellation is a mechanical, a kinetic cancellation, not a sound wave cancellation. Mm. So. Yes, you put that dual opposed subwoofer in the same spot as a single driver subwoofer. The the sound wave pattern is the same. That that isn't what's changing. We're just talking about it's not going to like physically start walking itself across the room. So, in terms of the ones that have two active drivers, one stacked, you know, above the other, that is just about form factor. That is nothing else. This is saying this is a way of having more surface area, right? Surface yep. area, you can either increase the diameter of the driver or you can just have more drivers, right? Mm. But you're getting more surface area. That's all it's about. And it's saying, if we wanted to get the same surface area, as, say two 15 inch drivers that are one above the other, well, we'd need, I don't know what it is, like a 20.5 inch diameter driver or something like that. That, which would necessitate, you know, a wider box. There's no way around it. You've just got this wider diameter driver. The box is going to have to get wider. Well, if I want that box to stay within a certain dimension, you know, I want it to be 17 inches wide and no wider so that it'll fit in the same space as a regular equipment rack or something like that. Well, I, I got to make the drivers a smaller diameter, but I want the larger surface area. I, I use two of them or four of them or whatever it is. Okay. That, that's all it is. It's, it's nothing more than saying, I want to design a subwoofer that physically fits in a certain width, but has a certain amount of surface area because I'm trying to achieve whatever output it is that I need. And mm -hmm. I want to get there via surface area rather than greater excursion. That's the other way you could do it. Smaller diameter, but it moves a whole lot more. But then you right. run into other problems. You need the bigger amplifier and you get more distortion. So the, oh, it's all trade-offs. It's design trade-offs. Right, right, right. The idea of dual driver subwoofers is not crazy. It solves problems, right? It's, right. it's not necessarily all about sound quality problems. Now we're talking about physical problems that we're solving by using okay. two drivers instead of one. So again, we're looking at the word beneficial. He asks, are yeah. they genuinely beneficial? And it's kind of like we were talking about earlier where you say better, but right. better might, is not the right word because it's just different for a different well, yes. purpose. In what way? <laughs> right. In what way? I have a 17 inch wide space, but my room is big enough that I need the output of an 18 inch diameter driver. Okay. How does it physically fit? I could use two 12 or two 13 inch drivers yeah. and now i've got the same surface area but it can fit in that 17 inch space and the 18 inch driver couldn't that is there beneficial to me <laughs> that's beneficial but it's not better like that's the way you ought to do all Sound the subwoofers. quality better no, no right right there we go okay well let's let's continue on one more question if you okay, feel like it's we've fairly covered long that but one. if you're willing uh, to well, i'm certainly that's willing. okay because see daz is on my friends list that's right. <laughs> and i feel like I these are good him. questions too <laughs> these are very good all right let's let's get on through these and then i'll uh escape because we are Perfect. now officially in the two hour plus club yeah 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 uh 
Daz has questions. First, an update from him. Thanks to our advice, he figured out that his Epson 5040 UB's cinema color filter is stuck out of the light path. So combined with Rob's advice about which picture mode to use and which facets of picture quality to prioritize, he set his projector in its natural picture mode until he can get it repaired. And he's quite happy with the results. So thank you. That helped. Excellent. Nice. Uh, <laughs> At some point in the not too distant future, he hopes to upgrade his projector. His room is fully light controlled. And even during the brightest parts of the day, it's pretty close to zero ambient light in the theater. That sounds like a good napping room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he isn't worried about any sort of lights on scenario. He'll continue using his 120 inch matte white screen. Excellent. His goal is is the best HDR experience within reason considering price. Mm -hmm. It would be cool if the projector could also do all the latest high frame rate and VRR stuff, but that isn't the highest priority. And even genuine 4K chips aren't necessary as long as any pixel shifting still delivers a clear, bright HDR image. So he likes HDR. Mm -hmm. So which projectors would we suggest to him? Does he just go from his Epson 5040UB to a 5050UB, or is there something else he should aim for? And I believe you've got recommendations from JVC and Epson. Yeah, and I mean, they aren't the cheapest things. Uh, no, they but, are not. You know, these are the ones that I consider within reason. <laughs> uh, yeah. <now>, a, <laughs> there are no projectors that do variable refresh rate. None. So that's a feature right. you're not going to be able to get. But you, there are projectors that do 4K at 120 hertz. So if you want that, those are the two that I'm going to mention to you. Now, if you want the best HDR that you can get from a projector at a semi-reasonable price, it's going to be JVC's NP5. All right, okay. that's their newest one. It's a genuine 4K chip, so there's no pixel shifting happening. Mm. Uh, it does 4K 120. And like genuine full on 4K 120, it just doesn't do bar variable refresh rate. Mm -hmm. uh, it uses a lamp, right? So the laser light engine version of it, the uh, NZ7, that's the one with Seven. the laser in it, is $11,000. Hey. So you can afford many replacement lamps for the difference in price between yes. the lamp version <laughs> and the laser version. Interestingly, Ooh. the lamp version here uh, actually has the better contrast versus the oh. NZ7 with the laser light engine. So huh. you're getting that, that benefit there. The NZ7 does have slightly wider color, thanks to using a laser uh, versus the lamp, but all things considered for the $4,000 difference in price, $7,000 is one where I'm like, maybe, maybe, 11,000 for me, I'm like, nope, too much. Uh, so Yeah, that extra digit, <laughs> that yeah. fifth digit in the <laughs> dollar right. figure, Ouch. Now, my absolute main reason for suggesting that to you as my highest choice is because you said HDR is so important to you, and JVC's projectors have the built-in frame-by-frame dynamic tone mapping mm, that okay. makes HDR on a projector about as good as it gets. Uh, it, it's really hard to do any better uh, in mm. terms of HDR on a projector. This is the cream of the crop. So if you can get there, It'd be great. $7,000 MSRP. Sometimes Ooh. if you call around like AV Science, one of our favorite projector retailers, you can probably get it for a little bit under that. But yeah, it's going to be definitely over $6,000. Okay, so if that's just too much, the next best choice is Epson's Pro Cinema LS12000. Okay. The MSRP on that is $5,000. So $2,000 less than the JVC. What's going on here? Well, it's native 1080p panels but they can move them around four times per frame. So you're actually getting all 4K pixels on the screen, just not mm -hmm. literally simultaneously, but you get all 4K resolution and it can do it at 240 hertz so you can actually do 4K 120. Okay. All right, so it, it does right. 4K 120. Uh, it's a laser light engine. You get wide color. The LS12000 does have the ultra black panels. So you're getting as good as an LCD projector can get. Not dissimilar mm. from your 5040UB mm. at all in terms of contrast and black levels. Uh, but you're getting the wider color with the lasers. You're getting the 4K 120. In terms of HDR, it does a good job. It does not have frame by frame dynamic tone mapping. Instead, okay. there is a 16 step manual slider. So if you're watching a particular program and thinking to yourself, everything looks too dim, you can move the slider to brighten HDR overall. Conversely, huh. if you're saying, I'm looking at stuff and I think there's some highlights being blown out in this movie, you can move the slider 
and get those highlights back. But you're doing that manually. It's not doing that dynamically frame by frame the way the JVC mm. can. So you just have to pick a level. Is that what you you're pick saying? a level? You can adjust it manually. So it's not mm. the greatest HDR, but it's better than a lot of other projectors that don't give you any adjustability whatsoever. And if it looks too dark, mm. you're stuck that way. So okay. at least it gives you the ability to make some adjustments movie by movie. There is the Home Cinema LS 11,000 that is at $4,000 MSRP. But okay. unlike the 5040 UB versus the 6040 UB or the 5050 UB versus the 6050 UB, there is a difference between the LS11,000 and the LS12,000. Yeah, okay. And that difference is the ultra black panels. The LS11,000 does not have the ultra black panels. So it is more similar to like Epson's Home Cinema 4010 as compared to your 5040UB. There's a pretty significant difference in the black levels and contrast. And I think it's well worth it when you're mm. talking about HDR to spend yeah, he doesn't want to go $1, backwards in black you level. You don't want to step yeah. down in black levels and contrast. Right. So... Those are the ones I have to point you to. Now, if all of that is too expensive, a 5050 UB is not a terrible purchase. It's just 4K 60 is the highest it goes. It cannot do 4K 120. Seems like he'd be okay with that. It does 1080p resolution times two for its pixel shifting. So you are not getting full 4K resolution. You're getting half 4K resolution because it's shifting a 1080p panel twice per frame at a maximum of 60 frames per second. Um, okay. And it's a lamp, of course, but... You know, the price is all the way down at $3,000. So much more affordable. Okay. <laughs> That's a, almost a frustrating, uh, uh, clear step to get each new feature. Like You, you, you spoke can, about a 3000 and a 4000 and a 5000 and a 7000 Right. If you can, the JVC NP5 at $7,000 justifies every penny of its price. If you want the best HDR you can mm. get from a projector, that's it. Like, it's cut and dry. I'm not going to say this is one where, uh, is it worth $2,000 more? Like, it is fully justified, in my opinion. Okay. And the black levels are unlike any other projector. Is it an OLED? No, no projector is. But it is noticeable even above your already very good Epson Ultra Black. The JVCs are another level. They justify so that price. He mentions doing things in the not too distant future. We may have just pushed it a little farther in the yeah, future yeah, with yeah. that price. Yeah. But I see what you mean. That that there's your big jump. That's one where you are getting your money's yeah. worth. It, it's okay. not a case of they just up the price for no reason. That that one you're getting your money's worth. All right. He's got some more questions. His eldest son is moving out. He's taken his PS5 with him. And that will be his only source device. Mm -hmm. Daz plans to give him his 5.1 set of Pioneer Andrew Jones speakers that he's no longer using. So what would be some good, better, best TV options that Daz could potentially buy for his son that would let him take advantage of what the PS5 can do? Oh boy, there's all kinds of choices for that. Well, I mean, I almost divide it into two because... The best choice is going to be an OLED of some kind. Now, I've given an array of OLEDs in the links that I'm going to provide in the show notes. Because, okay, let's start at the very top. What's the best gaming TV you could buy? Well, the one you could buy today would be an LG G2 OLED. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, their flagship 4K OLED. That would be the one that is the best because it's it's the brightest. It's the you know, it's, It does all mm. the things. Dolby mm. Vision with VRR at 120 hertz. Like it does absolutely everything that can be done from a video game system. So I don't know what size you're looking at. Uh, you know, that goes from $1,700 for the 55 inch. Uh, you know, the 65 inch is $2,200. The 77 inch is $3,600. The 83 inch is $5,000. And there is a 97 inch in the G2 series is $25,000. I don't know how generous of a dad you want to be. I'm guessing maybe not quite that much if seven thousand dollars for your own projector is out of the question <laughs> but you know though that would be the best all right so the one of course we're going to normally point you to is the c2 series the uh, lg c2 series right that has sizes all the way from 42 inches at 1200 dollars up to 83 inches at 4500 dollars and and like every size in between that is like the go-to choice does all the gaming things that are possible mm. i will say though uh, the B2 series yeah. is not a gigantic step down in no. any way. It has the slightly less sophisticated processor, but who cares if you're already feeding it 4K? It only has two HDMI 2.1 ports instead of four, like the C2 or the G2 has. But, you know, that's enough for both gaming systems <laughs> to plug it's into It's a significant HDMI. step down in price, too, at, it, and at yeah. each size. So yeah. 
I really like that B2. Yeah, well, the, I'm going to say B2 that, of course, because that's question. the... You know, the, the, the 77 inch is $2,300 versus $500 more for the C2 at $2,800. So right. th- there's cost savings to be had. I would consider the B2 if, if that's affordable, especially like the 55 inch, $1,100. It's less than yeah. the 42 inch C2 to get the 55 inch B2. I've seen it less B2. than that too. Oh, sure, I've sure. Seen it that was, that was today's that. prices as I was linking yeah. to it. So mm-hmm. for me, it's like, yeah, it's either going to be an OLED if you're going that much. If you just want to spend considerably less, I think there's one go-to choice and that's TCL's brand new R655 series. Mm -hmm. It does all the gaming things except for Dolby Vision VRR at 120. It can't do that. It can do Dolby Vision VRR at 60. But if it's not Dolby Vision, it can do HDR gaming at 4K 120 with VRR. Like, so it's, it's everything bar Dolby Vision at 120. That's the only thing the TCL R655 can't do. And your PS5 doesn't do that anyway. Only the Xbox Series X does that. So it's not even an issue for the PS5 that doesn't do Dolby Vision. So here you got a 55 inch version of the TCL R655 at $650. You know, so I mean, if you're talking a 55 inch TV, the least expensive OLED is 1100, 650 bucks for the 55 inch TCL. That is, TCL. that's on down there, yeah. You could go all the way to the 85 inch for 2000 bucks, 2000 bucks for an 85 inch TV. <laughs> and then there's a 65 and a 75 in between there at, you know, $950 for the 65 inch, 1500 oh. for the 75. So, you know, 1500 bucks could get you a 55 inch C2 or a 75 inch TCL or a 655. Yeah. Five. Maybe you gotta consider Does your that. son appreciate the <laughs> OLED picture? I gotta tell you, those TCLs are great gaming. They're TVs. not I, bad. I, and, I got and, one for my nephew, and I'm always blown away by it. I'm like, for the wait. amount I paid for this 55 inch TV, I'm like, it has no right to look this good. It's really good. And do you want him to have to worry about any sort of burn in? Uh yeah. yeah. So there's another mm-hmm. thought. I just keep thinking about many years ago when we bought our first high definition TV, a 50 mm-hmm. inch plasma for thirty two hundred dollars. That's right. <laughs> and it was a 50 inch that did thirteen sixty six by seven sixty eight. Wow. And I that was any, wait, any that's a lot of be, years ago. <laughs> I think that's any son 17. would be really happy with that TCL. <laughs> They're yeah. really nice. I, I think for him, yeah, I might want to go with the biggest TCL you can get. Ah. Because that's the excitement on your first good TV. Oh, yeah. Moving out for your own place. Get that huge TV. 55-inch OLED or 75-inch TCL? (laughs) Or, you know, you get it. You get a 65 for under a grand. Like, that's pretty darn good, man. It is, but you know what? Throw that 75-inch TV on the wall. He has got one (laughs) kicking system for somebody that's just moved out. I don't know. That that may be the way I would lean. But Mm -hmm. if he already has expressed appreciation for an OLED picture versus something else, like if if he's into it and he knows about the differences, then he might rather have a smaller OLED. I think, honestly, the takeaway I want people to have is it's either the TCL or jump all the way to an OLED. Because the, right. uh, in my opinion, there aren't any LCDs from you know Sony or Samsung or whatever that actually justify the in between price point. They're yeah. they're not better than the TCL. They just aren't. So not not enough to justify like, yeah. one or the other. <laughs> right. So there you go. Uh, I would I would lean toward a gigantic LCD. Yeah. Uh, LED LCD. Uh, okay. A little bit more from uh, uh, Daz, and then we'll finish up. Yes. We what will. would be a good AV receiver to get for him? He won't be going beyond the 5.1 speaker setup that Daz is giving him. Oh, you got all kinds of affordable options there. I mean, I'd head right over to Accessories for Less. Yes. I'm not worried about having absolutely everything, but I will consider, yeah, I want HDMI 2.1. I want this to be the simplest setup. If he does get an Xbox Series X, I want this mm-hmm. to be simple to handle. So the model that would do exactly what you need and nothing more <laughs> would be Denon's S660H. And at Accessories for Less, is 320 bucks. And I think that's pretty Come darn on. reasonable. Yeah. Uh, that is five speakers that it does. That's where it stops, but that's all he's going to have. So right. and it's got H- it's got three HDMI 2.1 ports. I'm like, yeah, that's darn good. If you good. want the option to go up to seven speakers, including doing it as a 5.2.2 uh, speaker configuration. So just so we can have Atmos light up on the front of the thing. Maybe that's all you want is to be able to have okay. Atmos light up on it. Then Denon's S760H 
for four hundred dollars from Accessories for Less. So you know, eighty bucks more, uh, as long as you're shopping at Accessories for Less for these things. But the S seven sixty H is same feature set, three HDMI two point one ports, uh, but seven channels instead of five. Wow. Uh, so in both of these cases, yes, it's just the base level Odyssey Multi EQ. I don't think your son is going to care. <laughs> no. And you're going to be able to switch <laughs> HDMI 2.1 sources if he does not get another gaming system. And yeah, I mean, 400 bucks for that S760H and being able to see Atmos light up on the front of it, pretty darn nice. I, I'd, I'd probably go at $80 difference. I think I would get the $400 one yeah. and then probably get him a 75-inch <laughs> LED. And then you're still under $2,000 for that, yeah. think about what he would be set up with for no less kidding. than two grand. No <laughs> kidding. Blows or, my you mind. know, under fifteen hundred bucks with a sixty-five inch killer TV. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Not, it not just bad. depends on not his space. Bad. So yeah. man, yeah. Well, there you go. That's a that's a lot of good uh, AV stuff today. I think so. Uh, we've got Stefan on the list uh, to be first up next week, and then uh, had a bunch of questions that came in on uh, Monday and Tuesday. So uh, they'll be they'll be coming up next week. First in, first right out. Right on right on yeah so scrolling back up the top here uh we'll just thank our listeners of the week once again uh wanted to mention you can go to avrant.com on the right hand side click the cup of coffee to take you to paypal if you want to make a one-time donation uh, there's patreon.com slash avrant podcast if you'd like to set up an automatic monthly donation so a big thanks to our 139 patrons over there who have done yeah. just that uh want to thank I didn't look it up throughout, throughout the podcast, so I'm pretty sure it was Gurinder who set uh, permission to use the photos he sent in on <laughs> avgadgets.com. Man, that's, I'll correct myself next week if it was the wrong person, but uh, uh, Tom will right. appreciate that. Yep, and then we got notes of gratitude just for keeping the podcast going. Bring into a brand new year here in 2023 from Dylan, Brad, Eric, Stephen, James, Mike, Nathan, Greg, Gurinder, Kevin, Stefan, Jack, and Carl. Big list, but... We appreciate it because it was Happy New Year wishes all around. So thank you Heck all yeah. very much for thanking us. Thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. If you want your question answered on this podcast, email it to us. Question at avrant.com is the place to send it. So please use that. And uh, if you want to get in touch with Mr. Lee Overstreet, where can people find you, Lee? Uh, for now, continue to find me on Twitter at Lee Overtweet. That's a good way to do it. And one day I'll get an email address. It's been Rant. requested by Nathan, a request that now will the, just never be heard by Tom, who's the one who's actually in charge of that. So <sighs> Listeners want me to have it. I know. <laughs> but the host Ten needs years. to know. How Ten will years he, we're working how on. Will he, how will Tom ever find out? There's just no way to know. Well, thank a you decade. all so much. <laughs> this has been AV Rant uh, on behalf of Tom Andrew, who's away this week. I am Rob H., and I'm Lee Overstreet. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.